Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to provide a report to the United States House of Representatives that Americans support impeachment. Last week, I introduced articles of impeachment against five people who have abused the power of their positions and provided corruption and disservice to the American people. I introduced articles of impeachment against U.S. Attorney Matthew Graves at the Department of Justice. Matthew Graves refuses to prosecute 67% of the crimes in Washington, D.C., and abuses his office in a political pursuit who he deems political enemies while persecuting people for January 6, people who just walked through the Capitol. Matthew Graves must be impeached. He should prosecute criminals in Washington, D.C. That, that commit all kinds of crimes every single day, not care about one day where people have already been arrested and are rotting in jail. Last week, I introduced articles of impeachment against FBI Director Christopher Wray by turning the FBI into Joe Biden and Merrick Garland's personal police force. Chris Wray has made himself a lackey of the regime. Under Ray's watch, the FBI has intimidated, harassed, and trapped American citizens that have been deemed enemies of the Biden regime. FBI even raided Mar-a-Lago on August 8th of 2022 in an unconstitutional raid of former president's home. FBI whistleblower Garrett O'Boyle told congressional investigators that the FBI created a terrorist threat tag following the Dobbs Supreme Court decision in 2022. O'Boyle confirmed that the purpose of the tag was to target pro-life individuals, and now Ray has weaponized the FBI against his own agents. These brave FBI whistleblowers have been stripped of their salaries and their security clearances simply for coming forward and bravely telling the truth. FBI Director Christopher Ray must be impeached. I introduced articles of impeachment against Attorney General Merrick Garland. Since Merrick Garland took over as Attorney General in March of 2021, he has completely weaponized the Department of Justice. The politicization of the Department of Justice has resulted in the persecution of the left's political enemies and a real two-tier justice system in America. Garland has used the FBI as a personal police force for his boss, Joe Biden. The Department of Justice's persecution of Joe Biden's primary political adversary, Donald J. Trump, is anti-democratic. Raiding the former president's home for legally declassifying documents is a transparent violation of justice. Persecuting a declared candidate for president of the United States is nothing short of election interference. But not only that from investigating parents who protest their local school, school boards to going after pro-life activists and Catholics, Merrick Garland must be impeached. What I want to tell the House of Representatives today is a Rasmussen poll was released just last week that 53% of voters in America, Republicans, Independents, and Democrats, support the impeachment of Joe Biden for high crimes and misdemeanors. I introduced articles of impeachment on Joe Biden last week because of the national security crisis as our, in our, at our border. I also introduced articles of impeachment against Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas for failing to do his duties to secure America's border. But he's only doing the bidding of his boss, Joe Biden. At 5 p.m. yesterday, I released a survey simply on my social media asking, do you support impeachment? 8,600 people responded, and that was just from 5 p.m. last night. 77% said yes, they support impeachment. Only 23% oppose. And if anyone's read the comments on my Twitter account, you know for sure it's not just Republicans that follow me. Joe Biden has deliberately compromised our national security by refusing to enforce immigration laws and secure our border. He has allowed nearly 6 million illegals from over 170 countries to invade our country. He has caused approximately 1,700% increase in border encounters in just one sector of our northern border. Under his reign, there have been approximately 1.4 million known gotaways who have evaded U.S. authorities. 
He has allowed fentanyl, the number one killer of Americans between ages of 18 and 45, to overwhelmingly flood into our country and kill over 300 Americans every single day. Joe Biden should be impeached. In my district alone, we have had an increase of 350 percent of fentanyl murders. Gentlewoman's uh, time has expired. Thank you. Joe Biden must be impeached. I yield. Members are reminded uh, to refrain from engaging in personalities towards the president. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, Joe Biden has failed the American people. He's failed to uphold his oath of office and preserve and defend the Constitution. From illicit family building, uh, <laughs> business dealings and millions of dollars in bribes and payments to himself and to his extended family. Joe and his border czar Kamala Harris have allowed an invasion at our southern border, jeopardizing the lives of hundreds of thousands and killing hundreds of thousands, thousands with fentanyl. They have directed their border patrol to release illegals into our country unfettered. In fact, the judge even had to intervene and stop Biden's release program. Joe Biden has violated Article 2 of the Constitution to take care and respect the laws of this country. So, Mr. Speaker, that is why I'm introducing articles of impeachment against Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Members are reminded to refrain from engaging. For what purpose does a gentlewoman from Colorado seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Clause 2A1 of Rule 9, I rise to give notice of my intent to raise a question of the privileges of the House. The form of the resolution is as follows, HRES 503, impeaching Joseph R. Biden, Jr., President of the United States for high crimes and misdemeanors. Resolved that Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. is impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors and that the following articles of impeachment be exhibited to the, to the United States Senate. Articles of impeachment exhibited by the House of Representatives of the United States of America in the name of itself and of the people of the United States of America against Joseph R. Biden, Jr., President of the United States, in maintenance and support of its impeachment against him for high crimes and misdemeanors. Article 1, abuse of power. The Constitution provides that the House of Representatives, quote, shall have the sole power of impeachment, end quote, and that the President of the United States, quote, shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, end quote. In his conduct as President of the United States and in violation of his constitutional oath faithfully to execute the office of the President of the United States and to, best, and to the best of his ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and in violation of his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Joseph R. Biden Jr. has abused the powers of the office of the President of the United States. In fact, using the powers of his office, President Biden has knowingly presided over an executive branch that has continuously overtly and consistently violated federal immigration law by pursuing an aggressive open borders agenda, by purposefully and knowingly releasing more than two million illegal aliens into the interior of the United States without the intention or ability to ensure that they appear in immigration court to face asylum or deportation proceedings. President Biden, has intentionally facilitated a complete and total invasion at the southern border. President Biden ended the migrate, migrant protection protocols to require aliens seeking asylum to remain in Mexico while being processed by the Department of Homeland Security. President Biden has closed Department 
of Homeland Security detention facilities and refused to cooperate with the state and local law enforcement officials in securing the border. He has allowed illegal aliens to enter the United States as asylum seekers, despite knowing they did not qualify for asylum. President Biden has pursued this open border agenda purposefully and willfully, circumventing every safeguard, check, and balance required by law, resulting in mass illegal immigration into the United States to the detriment of the American people. President Biden, with such conduct, has demonstrated a failure to uphold federal immigration law, violating his oath to the Constitution if allowed to remain in office, and has acted in a manner grossly incompatible with the rule of law and to the manifest injury of the people of the United States. Wherefore, President Biden, by such conduct, warrants impeachment and trial, removal from office, and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. Article 2, dereliction of duty. The Constitution provides that the House of Representatives, quote, shall, be the, shall have the sole power of impeachment, end quote, and that the President of the United States, quote, shall be removed from office on impeachment for and the conviction of tre treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors, end quote. In his conduct as President of the United States and in violation of his constitutional oath faithfully to execute the office of the President of the United States and in violation of his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, Joseph R. Biden Jr. has neglected the constitutional duty of the office of the President of the United States. In that neglecting the powers of his office, President Biden has abandoned his duties to ensure that the laws are faithfully executed and upheld by presiding over an executive branch that is continuously and overtly and continuous, consistently refused to enforce the nation's immigration laws and secure the southern border. President Biden has endangered the security of the United States and the health and safety of the American people. President Biden has caused a national security crisis and is endangering the lives of the American people. President Biden has presided over the largest influx of illegal immigrants in American history. And as evidence of his dereliction, the, de the deportation cases pursued by his administration are at historic lows. President, Biden, pre President Biden's negligence of duty has resulted in the surrender of operational control of the border to the complete and total control of foreign criminal cartels, putting the lives of American citizens in jeopardy. On President Biden's watch, illegal aliens have been processed and released into the interior of the country under a mass system of parole, contrary to the clear terms of federal immigration law. Utilizing the, quote, CBP-1, end quote, program, the executive branch will release nearly 40,000 illegal aliens per month into the United States. He has failed to uphold the mandatory detention and deportation provisions of immigration laws, resulting in the mass entry of inadmissible aliens and the continued presence of deportable aliens. Through this complete and total dereliction of duty, and extreme absence and oversight of his own administration's policies, President Biden has allowed more than 1,500,000 illegal immigrants to invade the southern border. On Joe Biden's watch, illicit fentanyl has killed more than 100,000 American citizens. In fiscal year 2023, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol seized more than 9,000 pounds of fentanyl at the southern border. In his failure to uphold the rule of law, President Biden has demonstrated that he will neglect his duty to execute the office to which he has been entrusted, violating his oath to the Constitution if allowed to remain in office, and has acted in a manner grossly incompatible with his constitutional duty 
to take care that the laws of the United States be faithfully executed. Wherefore, President Biden, by such conduct, warrants impeachment and trial, removal from office, and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. Nine, a resolution offered from the floor. Gentleman from Massachusetts reserves and the gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to my friend, Mr. Donalds from Florida. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of H.R. 529. And let's be very clear. The issue that is happening at our southern border, not the name calling or talking about former President Trump, what is happening at our southern border today and for the last two years under President Biden has been a dereliction of duty with respect to immigration law in the United States. If you want to speak to the actual issues at hand, it is the fact that the asylum provi uh, provisions under Joe Biden are a bastardization of asylum procedure as set forth in federal law by Congress. Congress never anticipated that you would have six million plus people come through the asylum process in two years. Congress never contemplated that you would have an asylum uh, procedure where you would have people on a seven to 10 year wait list to actually go through an asylum pr uh, procedure. The president knows this is the case and it is being done on purpose. That is a congressional purview. And that actually is a dereliction of his duty to faithfully execute the laws of the United States. So if the minority party wants to ask, about why we are here, it is that. Because it is my belief and the belief of many members on our side of the aisle that this resolution should go to the Homeland Security Committee so they can fully debate and go to the depths upon which Joe Biden has been derelict in his duty to execute the laws with respect to immigration in the United States, which has major impacts on the American people. There are 100,000 Americans who have died from fentanyl overdoses because of his dereliction of duty. We have a drug cartels on our southern border who have operational control of the southern border because of his dereliction election of duty. And if the president and congressional Democrats actually took the time to investigate this, like going to the southern border, they would know this too. I support this resolution. Gentlemen's time. Members should be in support of Gentlemen's it as well. time's expired. And from Tennessee, Mr. Ogles. Gentlemen is recognized. Mr. Speaker, Joe Biden's border policies have led to an all-out land invasion at our southern border, which is why Homeland Security should be investigating. Joe Biden's border policies have led to a drug crisis and thousands of fentanyl overdoses across our nation, again, the jurisdiction of Homeland Security. And Joe Biden's border policies have led to the murders of countless Americans at the hand of illegal aliens, again, a priority for Homeland Security. His blatant dereliction of duty to preserve, dereliction to protect, and dereliction to defend the United States of America and the American people deserves impeachment. Instead of Joe Biden, he has demonstrated time, time and again, policymaking and political decisions that he prioritizes illegal aliens over American citizens, over our wives, our daughters, and our children. His gross neglect and refusal to take action at the border warrants removal from his post, and again, why Homeland Security must investigate. That's why I support Congressman Boebert's articles of impeachment and referral to committee. The CPB had a record number of encounters with terrorists at the southern border. The security of our nation is being undermined by foreign enemies because they know we have weak leadership. We need to remove Joe Biden from the Oval Office and ensure that Americans are safe. We need a leader that puts America and its people first, not illegals. Thank you, Congressman Boebert. Thank you, Speaker McCarthy. Thank you for Chairman Green for taking this up. I urge all my colleagues to support the re referral to, of articles of impeachment to committee. And with that, I yield back. I yield two minutes to my I, good friend, Mr. Norman from South Carolina. I'll remind, I'll remind the members that uh, they are to refrain from engaging the president and direct their remarks to the chair. Gentlemen is recognized. 
You know, I find, it, I find it humorous for those watching on TV and for those in the balcony. They keep talking about President Trump. They won't talk about the current president, Joe Biden. I'm going to start off with a compliment. He's been able to accomplish being the worst president and has replaced Jimmy Carter as the worst president this country has ever had of all time. And it's because of his policies. I support this going to Homeland Security because, as has been said, the border is wide open. The gates are open. How many more deaths do we have to have? How many, many more of our young people uh, have to die? 100,000 last year of record. And as a Border Patrol agent said, there are no drug treatments in a morgue. How long are we going to have an administration that's going to take the handcuffs uh, and put them on the police? How long are we going to have an administration that is going to deplete our oil supplies and buy it from countries that don't like us? How long are we going to have an administration that is going to support abortion at, at, regardless of the term? How long? Uh, ask the average business owner in this country if he's having a good year or a bad year or prices coming up or going down. We've got the worst inflation uh, that we've had in a long time, and it simply cannot go on. The election cannot come quick enough. This man is, has sold out. This man has got to be replaced. And Homeland Security is the right way for this resolution to go because we'll get the facts. And uh, I fully support it. And Ms. Bobert, thank you for taking the lead on this. I yield back. Gentleman yields Reserve. back. The speaker, I yield two minutes to my good friend, Mr. Good from Virginia. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's refreshing to hear my colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to be so sober about the issue of impeachment coming after being in the majority for two years and the first time in the history of their country when there were two impeachment charges brought in this very house. You know, this impeachment should not be political. It should not be cavalier. It should not be flippant. You know, that would be uh, bringing impeachment charges based on a phone call where there was questionable content to a phone call of something that this current president is actually being investigated by the House Over Com Oversight Committee as we speak. That would be a, a, a cavalier flippant impeachment investigation would be uh, based with, with just one week left in someone's term just to tarnish or attack their personal legacy with no uh, opportunity for that to move forward other than just the charges. No, it would be cavalier to announce right after an election that we're going to impeach the MFR. That's what happened with our friends on the other side of the aisle. You know, there, there does need to be more consideration about whether or not impeachment is justified for depleting our strategic petroleum reserves on the eve of an election for political reasons. There should be more consideration as to whether or not a president should be impeached for taking authority that he says he doesn't constitutionally have the power to do, such as uh, the, uh, the uh, eviction moratorium or the student loan transfer scheme. No, more consideration might be warranted for the very things that are being investigated uh, by the current oversight committee relative to bribery allegations, influence peddling allegations. But what more investigation is needed for the border invasion? What more investigation is needed for the violation of Article 4, Section 4 responsibility to protect the states from invasion? How long will we let this border invasion continue? Are we to let it go on for another year and a half? How many is too many after 7 million illegals have invaded this country? There's 1.5 million gotaways. Those, those criminal gotaways, if only 1% are dangerous individuals, that's 15,000 reckless, dangerous individuals intending harm on this country. Would anyone take those odds that only 1% of that 1.5 million gotaways are indeed bad actors? And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from... All right. To John um, Mal Malili, Cape Coral. Did I say your last name right? Yes. Okay. Uh, what and when is Congress going to impeach uh, President Biden for obvious corruption? So I guess people are interested in this question. All right.
Well, I, I would say on the last point, I would, I would say hold on to that one for a second. So I get to, I sit on oversight committee. I think a lot, a, everybody in the room knows this. Um, a, a couple things. Number one, the information that is now available to the public, that would not have come out if we weren't in control of the oversight committee. So we were able to get to the bottom of this. With everything that has come forward now, everything from suspicious activity reports at the Treasury Department, which I've read, there's about 200 of them. I've read about 30 of them. Um, between the different members of the Oversight Committee, we've read all these reports. They are real reports. Uh, a, sus a suspicious activity report is a report that is filed with a financial, by a financial institution with the Treasury Department. So this is not a political document. When we were reading those, it became pretty clear that many financial institutions were concerned about uh, aspects of money laundering and concealing funds from the IRS. They were concerned about it then. Uh, we went from there to being able to depose certain individuals based upon what we read, and that information led us to see that they set up these LLCs, which were set up, that we have the legal filings, that multiple accounts were set up. We have those, those, those documents around that, and the purpose was to move money through the various accounts. Um, it was because of Chuck Grassley in the Senate and p people who contacted Senator Grassley that we found out about the forms that the FBI have from their whistleblower. Um, that, and we, when reading those forms, we found out about the, the whistleblower saying, I'm sorry, the confidential human source saying that well, according to the FBI, this human source is highly valuable and highly credible, and they've been paying this human source, they paid, it, they paid him or her more than $200,000 over the last eight years to deliver information to the FBI. So they've documented on the FBI's form that the human source says that Hunter Biden and Joe Biden both took $5 million from somebody associated with Burisma and the purpose was to get the prosecutor in uh, Ukraine fired, to take the heat off Burisma. I think the thing that gets lost in the shuffle is that the reason why Burisma wanted the prosecutor gone is because Burisma wanted to buy into a holding company in the United States in the oil and gas um, field to, in order to raise capital in the United States. And they knew that if they were under investigation in their home country, they would never be able to raise capital in the United States. So that's why the money was conveyed according to the confidential human source. That led to the IRS whistleblowers coming forward in the Ways and Means Committee and the IRS uh, whistleblowers, one of whom is the supervisory agent on the case, has testified that their investigations were uh, downplayed or held back and that came from the political brass at IRS and the Department of Justice. So, I say all that to say um, that you know, my comments to the speaker and to my colleagues is that, in my view, we actually have a two-track process for impeachment. I think the first is, the first is with uh, Merrick Garland, the Attorney General. This, the second is with the President of the United States. Now, I, I, want, I want to be, be clear on this, and, and this is the part where this is really uh, concerning. Um, with, with what is going on um, at the political levels of the IRS and the, and the Department of Justice and the FBI, um, there is a complete lack of trust uh, with, with the political brass of these agencies. I think you have a lot of men and women who work in these agencies. They are patriots, they are good people, they're Republicans, they're Democrats, they're independents, they do their job, they follow the law. But what we have seen is that it is the political brass that has caused so many problems. So I think that impeachment is one thing, but wholesale reform of these agencies at the political level is another. And that, that must be done. That must be done. 
the, the, the last thing is, and even when we took the majority and we knew in oversight, we knew in oversight that we were gonna look into these suspicious activity reports because we were given information about it and we really wanted to follow through. And even from the beginning, you know, people said, oh, okay, you guys are in charge, now go, to, now go and impeach. And my, state, my statement's always been clear, impeachment is serious. This is a serious charge against an official of our government if we go to that level. And we shouldn't cheapen it um, just because you know, of political getbacks, even though what happened to the former president was wrong and should not have happened. That you, you gotta have the evidence, you gotta have the facts. Um, and I'll just tell you, from everything I've seen, we're close to having all the evidence we need. And I'll leave it at that. The idea of an impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden has come up, especially this past week. Is that something you would support? Yes, I do, because I, I do believe that we have uh, grounds for that inquiry. Uh, number one, you have a president who's been pushing this Green New Deal uh, agenda. We talked about it a little bit earlier. He's been pushing that. But what nobody ever told the American people is that his son facilitated the sale of a cobalt mine for a Chinese company in Africa. Hunter Biden did that. The New York Times has reported that. So if Hunter Biden's facilitating the sale of a mineral critical to solar panels and President Biden is pushing a, a massive agenda for us to get and use and buy solar panels, does anybody think there's not a conflict of interest? That's number one. Number two, it is pretty clear to me that Joe Biden did use the weight of his, his office to influence policy in Ukraine when he was vice president of the United States. The Burisma executives told the FBI's, or they, they told the FBI's confidential human source that the Bidens got $10 million from Burisma. $10 million, right? And then months later, Joe Biden is telling Ukrainian officials in his capacity as vice president that he's going to withhold loans and make sure loans do not go to Ukraine if they keep the prosecutor looking into Burisma. That is public corruption. That's pay for play. The Democrats went after Donald Trump because he talked to Vladimir Zelensky about this issue. Joe Biden actually did the issue. So I think that's grounds number two. Grounds number three is, and this is, I think this still is what needs to be proven. I do believe that the White House through Merrick Garland has a, have obstructed justice by stonewalling and covering up these investigations into Hunter Biden. And if we can prove that, then I believe not only do you have impeachment of Joe Biden, but you have impeachment of Merrick Garland as well. Is that just based on a hunch or do you think you can find that proof? What does that proof look like? Oh, it's based on no hunch. It's based on the fact that and, and let me let me break this down a little bit more detail. Hunter Biden gets a plea deal. You mean to tell me that the attorney general of the United States doesn't know what's in that plea deal? That the deputy attorney general of the, of the United States doesn't know what's in that plea deal? That the chief of staff to the attorney general doesn't know what's in that plea deal? Second question. You don't think that the White House counsel knows about said plea deal and that the president doesn't know? It's his son. He knows. So that's number one. And I think that it's easy to tie that. Number two, David Weiss, who was investigating Hunter Biden, wanted to bring charges in D.C. and in California. The AUSAs, who all report to uh, Merrick Garland, did not let him bring charges going forward. You telling me the attorney general made no indication to his other AUSAs that uh, they should they should allow this to occur? The only person. When you have a, a district, when you have a U.S. attorney in one district go to another U.S. attorney, the conduit for that is actually the deputy attorney general of the of the United States, who right now is Lisa Monaco. If Lisa Monaco knows, Merrick Garland knows. If the U.S. attorneys in the other jurisdictions stop charges which legitimately should have been brought, that's obstruction of justice. That's not prosecutorial discretion. I'm not comparing the two impeachment yeah. inquiries. Donald Trump was impeached. There's now questions being floated about a potential Joe Biden impeachment inquiry. Do you think that this could potentially be setting a precedent of 
impeaching presidents, for every president you might not agree with politically? Uh, no, and, and here's why. And here's, and here's why we, and, and, I, and let me be say it this way. When we took over the majority, I was asked about impeachment a lot. And my mm-hmm. concern was, is that I didn't want impeachment and impeachment should never be a political tool, a political weapon. I do believe that the Democrats use it as a political tool and a political weapon. Because if you're gonna impeach Donald Trump for talking to Vladimir Zelensky about what was happening with Burisma, that's a problem. That's not an impeachable offense. That's one world leader talking to another. So that's number one, put that to the side. What we've done in the Oversight Committee is gone through a painstaking investigation to pull out evidence of public corruption. What we found speaks for itself, so much so that the White House Press Secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre, will not answer questions in the daily presidential briefing. Joe Biden will not sit for an interview with the press and even talk about any of this stuff. He ignores it and walks out the room. They have no defense. And, it, and what's even worse is most of the media doesn't even cover this. It's, it's, not, it's not as if they come out and say, well, the Republicans are saying that, but here's why it's faulty and, and wrong. They don't cover it. They ignore it. So that tells me that we definitely are onto something. I've also been very clear. If there are high crimes and misdemeanors that have been committed, then Congress does have a responsibility to impeach a president. We have that responsibility. But should it be weaponized? No, it should not. So that's why we're going through this process of actually building out a case and building out an Democrats basically moved on the first impeachment after two months. We've been investigating for six and we're still going to investigate. Congressman, we have to leave it there, but I really appreciate this conversation, and you're welcome back anytime. Congressman Byron Donalds, thanks so much. Welcome back, everyone. You know, in the months that we were gone, in the weeks, House Republicans have uncovered serious and credible allegations into President Biden's conduct. Taken together, these allegations paint a picture of a culture of corruption. Now, here's what we know so far. Through our investigations, we have found that President Biden did lie to the American people about his own knowledge of his family's foreign business dealings. Eyewitnesses have testified that the President joined on multiple phone calls and had multiple interactions. Dinners resulted in cars and millions of dollars into his son's and his son's business partners. We know that bank records show that nearly $20 million in payments were directed to the Biden family members and associates through various shell companies. The Treasury Department alone has more than 150 transactions involving the Biden family and other business associates that were flagged as suspicious activity by U.S. banks. Even a trusted FBI informant has alleged a bribe to the Biden family. Biden used his official office to coordinate with Hunter Biden's business partners about Hunter's role in Burisma, a Ukrainian energy company. Finally, Despite these serious allegations, it appears that the President's family has been offered special treatment by Biden's own administration, treatment that not otherwise would have received if they were not related to the President. These are allegations of abuse of power, obstruction, and corruption, and they warrant further investigation by the House of Representatives. That's why today, I am directing our House committee to open a formal impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. This logical next step will give our committees the full power to gather all the facts and answers for the American public. That's exactly what we want to know, the answers. I believe the President would want to answer these questions and allegations as well. This effort will be led by Chairman James Comer, at the Committee on Oversight, in coordination with Chairman Jim Jordan for Judiciary Committee, and Chairman Jason Smith on Ways and Means. Now, I do not make this decision lightly. 
And regardless of your party or who you voted for, these facts should concern all Americans. The American people deserve to know that the public offices are not for sale and that the federal government is not being used to cover up the actions of a politically associated family. Now, I would encourage the President and his team to fully cooperate with this investigation in the interests of transparency. We are committed to getting the answers for the American public. Nothing more, nothing less. We will go wherever the evidence takes us. Thank you. Mr. Do you support the House moving forward with an impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden? No comment at this time. You know, there's a mounting amount of evidence, and I'm, I know they're going to make the right decision. But let's remember, impeachment is about bringing the charges, and it's not about the conviction that takes two thirds of the Senate. Well, that's up to the House. Unless you've been living in your parents' basement. You can see, based on the evidence so far, that uh, President Biden was well aware uh, that his son was peddling influence and uh, aggressively enabled it. If you're going to impeach a president, you should have an inquiry vote. The Democrats didn't do that. But I think the way to make an inquiry legitimate is to have a vote as to whether or not you should have one at all, rather than just the leadership deciding. So I don't know if they have the votes, but I would applaud the process of where they actually have to vote. Some of the members of your own conference in some of those districts, like swing districts, who are concerned about going down this route, concerned about not having, not proving that Joe Biden took official action to aid his son, or politically speaking, that it could backfire on them in their swing districts. Uh, I think they have nothing to worry about. Uncovering corruption at the highest level, vice president and president of the United States, is our job. And this isn't political at all. This is about uprooting uh, uh, those that have not only covered up Joe Biden's crimes, but Joe Biden himself. And we've done months and months of work on the Oversight Committee, I think eight months now. And we have uncovered more information uh, wire transfers, bank statements, SARS reports showing that the Biden family has benefited by approximately $20 million and counting by abusing and, and basically selling Joe Biden's seat of power. Congressman Ken Buck says you guys have not proven your case yet. I think Congressman Ken Buck is more interested in working for your network than he is for the district that elected him. You don't think that he's... Uh, He's, he knows what he's talking about? I think he's, he is actually playing party politics. He's either looking for Joe Biden to appoint him to a position, maybe the open Republican FTC seat, or he's looking to be a CNN commentator. He's, he's not upholding the Constitution that he swore to protect because impeachment is very much a part of the Constitution. Do you think he deserves to be reelected? I think that's up to his district, but I've heard uh, rumblings coming out of that district. Do you support a primary challenger to him? I support his district in making sure they send a, a, a representative to Congress that actually believes in the Constitution, no matter how much they brag about their law degree. So you met with the speaker yesterday. Good morning. Welcome back. I think I hope you all had a productive August. We certainly did as House Republicans, and we're ready to get back to work this September. Yesterday, as you know, Speaker McCarthy announced House Republicans' intention to pursue an impeachment inquiry of Joe Biden. This is about transparency and answers for the American people, and ultimately accountability for what I believe will uncover the biggest political corruption scandal in our nation's history. For the past eight months, through the course of our constitutional oversight duties, House Republicans have uncovered that Joe Biden has lied to the American people about his knowledge and involvement in his family's foreign business dealings, and that he has potentially committed multiple impeachable offenses. House Republicans' investigations have uncovered evidence showing Joe Biden repeatedly lied to the American people about his knowledge and involvement with his son's foreign business dealings. When Joe Biden was vice president, he joined dozens of Hunter Biden's business meetings by phone and in person. Detailed banking records show that the Biden family and their business associates received $20 million in payments from foreign actors in places like Russia, China, Ukraine, and Romania, including payments during Joe Biden's time as vice president. 
More than 150 transactions involving the Biden family and other business associates were flagged as suspicious activity by U.S. banks. And a highly credible FBI source alleges that Joe Biden received $5 million in exchange for pressuring for the firing of a Ukrainian prosecutor who was investigating the Ukrainian natural gas firm that Hunter Biden was the, on the board of Burisma. These are allegations of abuse of power, obstruction, and corruption, and they warrant further investigation by the House of Representatives, which is why the Speaker has directed the House committees to open a formal impeachment inquiry into President Biden. The American people deserve transparency, and this impeachment inquiry is an important next step to deliver transparency, facts, and accountability. We are returning, as I said, from very successful and productive August district work periods where members were able to discuss with their constituents our efforts to deliver on our commitment to America, an economy that's strong, a nation that's safe, a future built on freedom, and a government that's accountable. We heard firsthand about the problems facing our communities, including the destructive border crisis that is raging in my home state in New York. Over the August work period, I was proud to lead a bipartisan congressional delegation to the Indo-Pacific and spoke with government and military leaders from our key allies and partners in Japan, Singapore, and Thailand about the looming threat of communist China. Funding our military and bolstering our defense capabilities has never been more critical. Which brings me to this week on the floor, House Republicans will tackle head-on passing our defense appropriations bill to counter communist China, eliminate wasteful woke programs infiltrating our military at the Biden administration's uh, ordering, and supporting our brave service members with the largest pay raise ever. Today, we are joined by, I'm going to first turn it over to Chairman Jamie Comer for an update on oversight. Thank you, Chair. Right now, the bank records and exactly what, what, what my family did to get the money. Are you what leading you this talk? investigation, or is this a three-committee investigation? Well, see, it, it, what we have, we have an investigation of the Biden crimes that's being led by the House Oversight Committee. Then what we've determined through the course of investigating the Biden crimes is there's a, a cover-up. And the cover-up to being investigated by the Judiciary, Ways and Means, and Oversight Committee. So we're all working together. Uh, if we find something out that pertains to uh, the government abusing its power, then we communicate with the other committees. But we communicate with the committees on everything. So who's going to have you, the hearings? Who will be having the hearings? Well, it depends on what the hearing's about. If it's about uh, the IRS abuse, that'll be in Ways and Means. If it's about the DOJ abuse, it'll be in Judiciary. No joint if it's about the bank, well, we can do joint. We'll, we'll waive people on and off. The last Biden hearing, I waived Jason Smith on, and, and Jordan's already on oversight. So uh, we'll work together. We communicate almost on a daily basis. And, I'm very happy that we had the impeachment inquiry because what I said in the very, very beginning, we're going to follow the money. And we're, we're at the point now, it's getting harder to obtain the bank records that we need. I think we've proven a, a lot of things that no one knew when we started this investigation. No one knew that the, uh, the Bidens had 20 shell companies. No one knew that uh, this money was, most of this money transferred to the Biden family while Joe Biden was vice president. Uh, the president said that his family never got any money from China, and that's that's not true. We've proven that wasn't true. Uh, the president said he never met, with or talked to any of these people who sent him the money. We've proven that wasn't true. <coughs> so uh, it's very concerning the pattern of lies that Joe Biden has said. Uh, what we have today now is the impeachment inquiry where we can move forward in court and try to obtain some more bank records. What is your time? What is your time? What is your time? I'll be very. Do you, you want it to be done by the end of the year? Is that your plan? I, I would. I would love to be finished as quickly as possible. But uh, it seems like the more information we find, the the, the more uh, the more information we need to obtain. So what we've got is we we found again that this president has not been truthful with the American people. The CNN poll shows that 63 percent of the people uh, believe that the president was involved in his family's shady business things. I don't think anybody's defending the family now. I don't think anybody's defending the fact that this family has received over $20 million from bad people in bad countries that no one can say what they did to receive this money. There are no legitimate businesses. When we did the first bank record, it was on that Robinson Walker account, and it was money from China. And that day that we, we <coughs> announced the, the wire to Hunter Biden, his lawyer said, well, that money was used for seed capital. And I said, that's not true, because there is no legitimate business. They've never mentioned that again. So since then, we've, we've come up with another $20 million. 
that they cannot say what they did to receive the money. Now, if my child received a wire from a foreign national, I think you all would have a lot of questions for me. Uh, we're very concerned. If the president had been truthful, we wouldn't be here. If the president and this administration was cooperating with our investigation, we wouldn't have to do impeachment inquiry. Unfortunately, we do. Uh, we now have every tool we need to, to move forward in court successfully, and that's where we're headed. And I, I've got to go. I've got another minute. Say I'll, I'll say this. I will say this. We, we will be transparent with the press. Every time we find new information out, we have a press conference. We provide bank memorandums. We will continue to do that. So thank you all. Will you subpoena Hunter Biden? Biden? For what purpose does the gentleman from the great state of Missouri seek recognition? Rise to address the House for one minute, ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. And without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to voice my strong support for the impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. House Republicans have uncovered serious and credible allegations into his conduct, a culture of corruption. We now know this to be true. The Biden family received more than $20 million in foreign payments from China, Russia, Ukraine, and Romania. That 10% cut for the big guy, well, yes, that was for Joe Biden. The Bidens created over 20-plus shell companies to conceal the money. Joe Biden joined 20 phone calls with Hunter Biden's business partners, texts invoking Biden to shake down a Chinese business partner for cash. Joe Biden using pseudonyms on emails and at least 150 suspicious activity reports. Joe Biden's pattern of behavior is deeply disturbing and concerning for our national security. Mr. Speaker, we need answers. We need those bank records. We need the truth. Thank you. I yield back. Are you supporting this effort to move forward in impeachment inquiry to President Biden? I think there are a lot of questions my constituents have about how the president, uh, president's family made their money overseas. Uh, and I think that this process might get us some answers on that. Do you think this is a good thing politically for you in your district, representing a swing district like that? I'm not, not really concerned right now about the politics. I'm concerned about uh, the Congress doing their job. This right now is not on my plate. But nevertheless, I think my constituents deserve some answers. Oh. Would you vote? Would you have voted to open the impeachment inquiry? I haven't stated how I would vote for that, but uh, I'm comfortable with the process as it stands right now. Do you think that Republicans should have had a little bit more hard evidence before launching this impeachment inquiry? I mean, it's an inquiry. It's, it's, a, seek, it's a seeking of facts right now. And I think we need more facts because there are a lot of questions right now. Politically, though, heading into this critical election year, is this what the party should be focused on? I, I think I answered the question of politics right now. I think this is the time to govern and to ensure that uh, we have more facts. Congressman, your colleague Ken Buck, who has been, you know, more vocally opposed to this process than, and then others, has said that he's getting a private briefing from leadership yeah. to show the evidence that they have thus far. Have they offered you any such? Briefing? Uh, I did get offered a, a briefing at 5:30, but I was on the train from New York and I couldn't attend. Do you worry about overreaching at all? Sure. I, I think that we need to be balanced in this approach. I, uh, I don't think that impeachment ought to be used as a political tool or a weapon, especially around election year. I think we need to be in a quest for facts, and if we stick to that. I think we'll be on firm ground. What do you think about the timing of the inquiry, particularly as we run into this government funding situation here coming up in a, a few weeks? Uh, Congressman Rosendale has said that he thinks it's a little bit fishy. Uh, I'll leave that to my colleague to, to, to speculate, come to his own conclusion. The timing is probably never good on, on things like this, but I think, again, if we're just looking for facts and, and answering questions that a lot of people are asking me in my district, I was home for six or seven weeks, a lot of folks ask me what Congress is doing about this. This, short of impeachment, uh, is a good way to find out the facts. What do you think of the Freedom Caucus's demands about the spending bill, the short-term spending bill, and adding a whole new bunch of measures, deeper spending cuts? Are you comfortable with the demands that they're making? I think, once again, we, we're showing we have a, quite a, bit, a diverse district, ideological, diverse conference ideologically. And just like the debt ceiling, I think we'll hash out some of those differences. It may take a little time, it may get a little nasty, but I think we'll figure it out. Because even Matt Gates has suggested they could vote to oust McCarthy if he puts a CR on the floor. What do you think about that? I, I've heard that before. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Congressman, what would your Thanks. bar be in terms of moving forward with articles beyond the I think we probably need to parallel a legal standard that exists in the regular world. We can't look back to a couple of years ago where impeachment was used too quickly. It can't be used politically. It has to be used based on facts and law, and the inquiry does that. You want to see a real crime, is what you're saying. You're talking about I want to see facts. I don't want to come to any conclusions. 
I don't want to uh, predict what might happen. I want to see facts. Back to be clear that the president was directly engaged in, in corruption or bribery. Here's what we know. Here's what, we, here's what we've been told. The family took tens of millions of dollars from countries who are adversaries in languages they didn't speak and professions in which they had no experience. That leads most reasonable Americans to have questions as to how that money was actually earned. Are you concerned that most of this, the, the claims and evidence that your colleagues in oversight and judiciary have is regarding the time when Biden was vice president and not during his current role as president of the United States? Um, I think that if we do this inquiry, we would be able to understand what those facts and timelines would be. I mean, if there was a quid pro quo, was it contained to just his prior office, or does it reach his current office? That, that's a fact that we would want to know. Are you worried at all about how even pursuing an inquiry will play back home in your district? I didn't get here worried about politics. Uh, I've served my country in, in, in different ways. My family has served in different ways. I'm interested in doing the right thing, and that, I think, will keep me here as long as possible. Thank you, Chair Stefanik, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Emmer letting me uh, jump in here. We have a committee hearing that uh, will begin shortly. Uh, I just want to kind of go back to where we were in January when we started this investigation. This was the narrative. The narrative was that the laptop, the President's son's laptop, was Russian disinformation. Hunter Biden was a legitimate business guy, just like Jared Kushner. No Biden ever took money from China, because that's what Joe Biden said. Uh, no money ever changed hands while Joe Biden was vice president, and I actually believe that. Uh, Joe knew nothing about his son's dealings, and Joe never met with or spoke with any of the foreign nationals who had wired the family money. All of those things have been proven wrong because of the Republican majority and in our investigation. Now, in addition, what else we found? We found 20 shell companies. A shell company, just let me make sure everyone understands, it's not a company that manufactures shells. A shell company is a fake company. The Bidens have 20 of these, 20 of these. And when you talk to the, to the president, you get asked, what exactly do these companies do? What good or service do these companies provide? And the answer is nothing. They are not legitimate companies. We found, as, as Chair Stefanik said, 170 major bank violations. These were from six major banks. And they allege that the Bidens were, among other things, money laundering and receiving suspicious wires from state-owned entities. You know what that is in banking terms? That's a foreign government. And you know what the state-owned entity was? China. So the bank alleging that the Bidens took a suspicious wire from the Chinese government and then laundered it through these shell companies. There's many laws broken there. And this was in Treasury Cabinet, and this is what I fought to go to Treasury to get. This is very serious allegations. The Associated Press just wrote a story that said there's no evidence of wrongdoing. What a disgrace to journalism. And I don't complain much. I take it. But that's just not true. Uh, we also learned that nine Biden family members have received money from foreign entities, nine families, including the president's granddaughter who received uh, a wire that had been laundered to the shell companies from Romania days after the president left Romania when he was vice president. That's hard to explain. <clears throat> the Bidens received over $20 million. My question to you, what did they do to receive that money? No one can answer that question. $20 million. Is there not any curiosity? as to what they did to receive $20 million. We also found a Form 1023, an FBI form alleging Joe Biden took a bribe. And what we learned from this is the FBI never investigated this allegation. And in the FD 1023, it said that investigators would take 10 years to figure out where these bribes went because of the, the various bank accounts that they wired the money through. That was written years before anyone knew the Bidens had shell companies and the Bidens were laundering money. And what we see in the, the FBI form that no one ever investigated is a consistent pattern with what we found in Romania and China and other places. We also discovered that Joe Biden's used at least three pseudonyms on over 5,000 emails. We know one of these, his son was copied in a pseudonym that pertained to Ukraine. 
Uh, we've also just recently discovered an email from the State Department, from the Obama State Department, to Victor Shokin, the prosecutor who Joe Biden fired in Ukraine in exchange for the billion dollars, praising him for the great work that he did. But there was this narrative that Joe Biden created that said Shokin was corrupt and he needed to go over there and be fired. But we have an email weeks before Joe Biden went over there praising Shokin for the good work he had done in reforming corruption from the John Kerry State Department. Uh, so we also have testimony from Devin Archer saying that at that same time period, Joe Biden went to Ukraine to fire the prosecutor, that Hunter was being squeezed by the owners of Burisma to call DC for help. This is all in a timeline here. This is why Speaker McCarthy launched the impeachment inquiry. And I think the CNN poll two weeks ago that showed 63% of Americans believe Joe Biden was involved in his family's business schemes is reason why we should be investigating this. Moving forward, we have, we have requested unredacted pseudonym emails from the National Archives. There are over 5,000 of those that we want to review. Uh, we have to get uh, Obama, President Obama has to sign off on those, so he's supposedly reviewing them as we speak. We hope to get those. Uh, we hope to get uh, the president's son and brother's personal bank accounts. We uh, also want to interview people who have knowledge of some of the things that President Biden may have done in exchange for the millions and millions of dollars that his family received uh, from these four nationals. And lastly, we plan on having a hearing uh, in September uh, that will kind of uh, evaluate some of the things that we believe uh, have have happened from the Biden family that are in violation with our laws. So with that, I hope I answered some questions as to the evidence that has been found, the purpose as to why uh, we have moved to impeachment inquiry and the path forward. We, what I said in January holds true to today. We are following the money and we will see where that leads us. Thank you and I yield back. Great, we'll now go to Ken Calvert, our Cardinal on Defense Appropriations. No, no, I think um, the, the speaker really effectively laid out all of the evidence. Um, and uh, what we talked about was another session to really dive into it. I, I don't think people have had a chance to read all 160 um, of the uh, suspicious activity reports, really dive into the complicated web of corruption that, that we've been uncovering and really made the case that in order to get things like bank records, credit card receipts, uh, the, the records for these LLCs, uh, that we're going to need the strongest legal position that we can be in. Gentlewoman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Illinois seek recognition? The gentlewoman is recognized. Mr. Speaker. I rise to address the historic impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden. Congress must hold Joe Biden accountable for serving as the kingpin over a shady, a series of shady foreign business deals involving his family members. Bank records and extensive evidence show that the Biden family received $20 million in cash, diamonds, and sports cars from China, Russia, Ukraine, Romania, and other foreign entities. Joe Biden was directly involved in this foreign influence peddling scheme, and when Biden's son demanded $5 million in cash from a Chinese official, he wrote, I'm sitting here with my father. Congress has a duty to the American people to protect taxpayers from this type of foreign corruption. Thank you, and I yield back. Hello, everyone. It's your Congresswoman, Ashley Hinson. This week, House Republicans launched an impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. It's an effort I fully support. Serious allegations about President Biden's involvement with his son, Hunter Biden's overseas business dealings and influence peddling have come to light. From bank records showing nearly $20 million in payments directed to the Bidens through shell companies to more than 150 transactions involving the Biden family flagged as suspicious activity by U.S. banks. Our investigations also found 
that President Biden lied to the American people about his knowledge surrounding his family's foreign business schemes. Incredible whistleblower testimony revealed that Hunter Biden received special treatment and sweetheart plea deals from his father's administration. The American people, you wouldn't know any of this information without our rigorous oversight. Throughout this process, the White House has continually moved the goalposts and stonewalled congressional oversight at every turn. The American people deserve answers. Let me be clear, I have never supported impeachment for political reasons as the Democrats did with President Trump. The credible allegations uncovered against President Biden thus far warrant additional investigation. Our impeachment inquiry will allow us to get the full story, uncover the facts, and follow them wherever they may lead. whistleblowers, for example. We have had a lot of whistleblowers come forward and bring powerful testimony. Uh, we've identified millions, over $20 million in shell corporations, in illegal payments, uh, things that I don't think anybody would have seen if we wouldn't have had the Oversight Committee, the Judiciary Committee, and the Ways and Means Committee being so aggressive at trying to get the information out. But they've started to hit a wall and impeachment inquiry is the next step to get additional information from the White House because the White House has been stonewalling some of that information, but it's incredibly devastating already some of the information that has come out on the millions and millions of dollars and shell corporations, in some cases from foreign countries, that have gone to the Biden family. And I think everybody in America ought to want to know more about this. And the impeachment inquiry gives us the opportunity to go and find more of the facts. We're going to continue to find the facts wherever they lead. Thanks, so, everyone. I'll be seeing y'all in the halls along the way. I know we'll be keeping our distance, but uh, it's good to see y'all. It's good to be back. Thank you. Thank you. Get your phones. Thank you, my friend from Louisiana. <clears throat> I rise today in full support of House Republicans' formal impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. Seven months ago, House Republicans returned oversight to the People's House. We worked consistently day after day to make your government more accountable, as promised in our commitment to America. Since January, concerning and credible allegations against President Joe Biden have emerged, including abuse of power, obstruction of justice, corrupt business uh, foreign business dealings, influence, in, influence uh, peddling schemes that led to tens of millions of dollars in the pockets of several members of the Biden family. So far, $20 million in, in profits to a family has nothing to do with our government at this point. I think we can all agree Americans deserve accountability from our president. Our impeachment inquiry is not a political ploy. It's an opportunity for Congress to continue its duty, digging into the potential of corruption and bringing facts to light. The evidence is very troubling. Our witnesses have testified to President Biden's involvement in phone calls, interactions, and dinners that resulted in significant financial gains for his son and his son's business partners. The Treasury Department alone has flagged more than 150 transactions involving the Biden family and other business associates as suspicious activity by U.S. banks. Even a trusted FBI informant has alleged a bribe to the Biden family. There's evidence that President Biden used his official office to coordinate with Hunter Biden's business partners regarding Hunter's role with Burisma, a Ukrainian energy uh, company. These actions and more raise serious questions about the integrity of our highest office. Our government serves the interests of all Americans, not just a selected few. Rest assured, House Republicans will follow the evidence wherever it leads, and the truth will come to light. Thank you, my good friend from Louisiana, Representative Johnson, and for bringing this team together tonight, and I yield back. Thank you, my friends. Well said. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield next the gentleman from uh, Idaho, Mr. Fulcher, uh, for so much time as he may consume. 
Thank you, Mr. Hey guys, we're wrapping up a crazy busy week here in, uh, in Washington, D.C., but uh, I was going to visit about what we're doing in the Senate, but really Chuck Schumer's got us pretty locked up with, uh, as far as the floor goes. But I have been getting a lot of questions about what's happening on the uh, on the House side, especially with the impeachment inquiry. And, and, and so let's talk about that. What does that mean? That doesn't mean we're moving towards impeachment. What it means is that it gives the uh, Oversight Committee, Judicial Committee, and the Ways and Means Committee to be able to subpoena and get the information they need where right now the administration has been holding that up underneath executive privilege. Once the impeachment inquiry takes place, the judges then can order them to release it. And so to be quite frank, we probably wouldn't even be here right now if the administration, if the Biden administration, the Biden family would have been forthcoming with the information. But instead, they're stonewalling us every step of the way. Uh, we continuously get more and more um, uh, whistleblowers moving forward and the whistleblowers even though they haven't even collaborated their stories or talked to each other they're coming from different areas of the government um, they have all basically confirmed what the other person has been saying regardless of they're coming forth in the judicial committee or they're coming forth in the oversight committee or they're coming forth in the ways and means committee it's interesting how how the, the this their what they're saying has been intertwined so it's raised a tremendous amount of red flags. And the only reason why this is even moving forward is because, thank God, the Republicans are actually doing oversight and they're actually controlling the House because if not, Nancy Pelosi would have swept all this underneath the rug, like the administration was trying to do, why the, why the IRS wasn't allowing the, the, to move forward, why the DOJ wasn't allowing any of the investigations to move forward. The House is now truly holding people accountable, which is what they're supposed to be doing. So the next step is once they get the information uh, and they find that what he has done has created an impeachable offense. Now, remind you, that's a very high par set in the Constitution. And, and so if it does reach that, then they will proceed with the impeachment um, hearing and take a vote on it. If, the, if that goes through, then they will send the impeachment uh, articles of impeachment to of the Senate, and then we basically work as a juror, as the as whoever is being impeached. In this case, it'd be President Biden. We'd work out as a juror as he's on trial in the Senate. So, just kind of tell you how the process is working and what that what is what's led us to this. I just hope that's that's helpful to you. Um, once again, thank you for allowing me to serve uh, the great state of Oklahoma. It's such an honor. Um, I, I I really feel privileged by it. Uh, may God bless you, and may God bless United States of America to get the job done, but I'm not waiting throughout the rest of this Congress to actually hold Joe Biden and his corrupt family accountable. He knew while he was running for president that he was involved in this corruption and this bribery scheme, and that right there compromises him as president of the United States. I'm ready for a straight up and down vote on the floor, yes or no, impeach Joe and, Biden. And when are we, yes. we going to see some actual evidence as opposed to allegations? Uh, we've produced lots of uh, evidence out of the uh, out of the House Oversight Committee. So how about you go through and look at what we've done, look at the hearings that we've had, and... Uh, isn't it true that Speaker McCarthy that? can't get the you, votes right look, now? How about you That's why he hasn't gone for a vote. That's why he's gone for it the way he's gone for it today. Well, let's force the vote then. Let's it, see. Let's but he hasn't got the record. vote, has he? No one has been not put all on Republicans, Not all, all yes Republicans no. support this impeachment inquiry. It, it well, then maybe it, their constituents shouldn't support them anymore. If it takes too long to get a vote, will you support a motion to vacate the chair against McCarthy? Uh, if it takes too long to get a vote for impeachment, then I'm forcing a vote on impeachment. How long are you willing to wait before you force this vote? Not very long at all. Weeks? How long is not very long? Days? Weeks? All right, y'all. Have is a great this day. Thanks. the most Thanks. important issue for your constituents in Colorado? Uh, spending is the most important issue right now. Um, that is that is the fight that we're at. But everywhere that I go, people are having a hard time buying groceries, affording gas, getting to work, paying for their child care, affording the homes that they live in, or the homes that they would like to live in. Everywhere that I go, it is a struggle financially. We have got to get the spending under control in Washington, D.C. I'm here because I was tired of politicians over-regulating, over-spending, over-taxing, and destroying everything that we were working so hard to build. I put my life on hold as a mom of four boys to come up here and actually do something. And I am not coming up here to just be a wallflower and sit by and do things as, as usual. 
We had the speakers fight in the beginning of the year because we said we will do our jobs. We've been granted this majority in the House and we will do our jobs and do it efficiently in a timely manner so the American people can afford to live again. We need to secure the southern border, become energy independent again, and damn right we need to hold Joe Biden accountable by Aren't you using this spending bill? bill? Aren't you using the spending bill though as a way to threaten yeah. McCarthy to launch this impeachment investigation, which is really political revenge for the we impeachment can and walk at the same time. Have a great is day. Is that not true though? Is that not true, Congresswoman? Aren't you just using this spending bill as a way to threaten Speaker McCarthy? Last week, Speaker McCarthy directed the House committees to open a formal impeachment inquiry into President Biden. This impeachment inquiry is about one thing and one thing only, and that is providing answers for the American people. Nothing more, nothing less. Americans gave our House Republican majority a mandate to provide transparency and accountability, and that's exactly what we've done over the last eight months. Chairman Comer has shown that the Biden family engaged in a disturbing pattern of corruption that included selling government access to foreign adversaries like China. Throughout our investigations, we found that President Biden repeatedly lied to the American people about his involvement in his family's corrupt business dealings. We also discovered that then Vice President Biden likely used his official office to coordinate with Hunter Biden's foreign business partners. Opening a formal impeachment inquiry will give our committees the full congressional authority needed to get the American people the answers they deserve. And if they uncover evidence of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, then and only then will the next steps towards impeachment proceedings be considered. I fully support Speaker McCarthy's commitment to follow the facts wherever they lead and ensure that no one, not even President Biden, is above the law. Elise? Sure, oh. we're going to go to Dusty Johnson next, then we'll hear from Chip Roy and Stephanie Bice. Dusty. Yes. Um, what do you expect the Ways and Means Committee's um, involvement to be moving forward on the impeachment inquiry? You know, you just used uh, Power 6103. Do you think you would use it again, or would it be through subpoenas? You know, how do you expect that to move forward? You know, we're definitely moving. Um, we're going to follow the facts, like I said. Um, there are several individuals that we want to hear from. Leslie Wolf is one of the 13 that we requested the last week in June. So there's numerous individuals. We're going to continue to push for them to come forward and answer the questions that we have. Yes. Um, on the impeachment hearing tomorrow, you're going to uh, be there. What is it that Republicans are, are hoping to accomplish this with this? What is the, the goal of this hearing when it doesn't have Hunter Biden associates, when it doesn't have Biden administration officials or somebody like Leslie Wolf, just these, these experts? What's the, the point of, of this particular hearing? There's definitely a lot of questions about what is an impeachment inquiry, um, what does that encompass, what's going on, and um, what is precedent in the past. A lot of that, according to what you see as the witnesses, um, that is what I would predict, predict that you're, go you're going to hear at that hearing. I'm not the chairman. Um, Jamie Comer is the chairman of Oversight. I'll be waving on, but um, that is my projection of what you're going to hear at the, the hearing. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just your response to this. Shortly after Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer announced there was bipartisan support for Senate's version of continuing resolution, several Senate Democrats, including Senator Brown of Ohio today, slammed House uh, Republicans' priorities going after uh, this impeachment inquiry after today's uh, press conference uh, with Ways and Means. Uh, your, your response to, while House Speaker Kevin McCarthy announced that a continuing resolution he wants to bring it forward. It doesn't appear that they have the votes yet to, to pass that by the end of the week. Should House Republicans be focusing on these other priorities and not averting a government shutdown? House Republicans can walk and chew gum. We're pretty good at that, and that's ex exactly what we're doing. I have full faith that we'll be able to del deliver funding. I will point out that the United States Senate has yet to pass one appropriations bill. One. They've not even passed one. They said three weeks ago that they were going to pass some. We have passed bills. We were here at 1230 last night voting on appropriations bills. The Senate has not taken one vote, one vote on the Senate floor in regards to appropriations. So they can do a lot of talking, but I haven't seen any action of them. Thank you all very much. 
Since assuming our Republican majority in January, the House Oversight and Accountability Committee has uncovered a mountain of evidence revealing how Joe Biden abused his public office for his family's financial gain. For years, President Biden has lied to the American people about his knowledge of and participation in his family's corrupt business schemes. At least 10 times, Joe Biden lied to the American people that he never spoke to his family about their business dealings. He lied by telling the American people that there was an absolute wall between his official government duties and his personal life. Let's be clear, there was no wall. The door was wide open to those who purchased what a business associate described as the Biden brand. Evidence reveals that then Vice President Joe Biden spoke, dined, and developed relationships with his family's foreign business targets. These business targets include foreign oligarchs who sent millions of dollars to his family. It also includes a Chinese national who wired a quarter of a million dollars to his son. Joe Biden also lied to the American people about his family making money in China. He continued to lie about it even when the House Oversight Committee uncovered bank wires revealing how the Bidens received millions from Chinese companies with significant ties to Chinese intelligence and the Chinese Communist Party. Just this week, we uncovered two additional wires sent to Hunter Biden that originated in Beijing from Chinese nationals. This happened when Joe Biden was running for president of the United States and Joe Biden's home is listed as the beneficiary address. To date, the House Oversight Committee has uncovered how the Bidens and their associates created over 20 shell companies, most of which were created when Joe Biden was vice president, and raked in over $20 million between 2014 and 2019. We've also identified nine Biden family members who have participated in or benefited from these shady business schemes. Now, what were the Bidens selling to make all this money? Joe Biden himself. Joe Biden is the brand, and Joe Biden showed up at least two dozen times with business targets and associates sending signals of access, influence, and power to those prepared to pay for it. The American people demand accountability for this culture of corruption. They demand to know how these schemes have compromised President Biden and threaten our national security. They demand safeguards to be put in place to prevent public officials from selling access to their public office for private gain. Under the leadership of Speaker Kevin McCarthy, House Republicans have now opened an impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. By opening an impeachment inquiry, our investigation is now focused on whether President Biden engaged in impeachable offenses under the U.S. Constitution. It empowers Congress, elected by the people, to continue providing the answers, transparency, and accountability that the American people demand and deserve. In recent history, Democrats inflicted much damage on the credibility of congressional investigations by peddling the Russian collusion hoax. But this committee, under this majority, will not pursue such witch hunts based on manufactured allegations, innuendo, and no real evidence. Today, the House Oversight Committee will examine over two dozen pieces of evidence revealing Joe Biden's corruption and abuse of public office. This includes emails, text messages, bank records, and testimony of Biden business associates. We will hear from legal and financial experts about this evidence and crimes that may have been committed as Joe Biden was sold around the world. The House Oversight Committee, along with the committees on the Judiciary and Ways and Means, will continue to follow the money and the evidence to pr provide accountability so that Americans know their public offices are not for sale. Thank the gentleman for yielding. This is a tale as old as time. Politician takes action that makes money for his family, and then he tries to conceal it. Never forget four fundamental facts. Hunter Biden gets put on the board of Burisma, gets paid a lot of money. Hunter Biden's not qualified, fact number two, to sit on the board. Not my words, his words. He said he got on the board because of the brand, because of the name. Fact number three, the executives at Burisma ask Hunter Biden to weigh in and help them with the pressure they are under from the prosecutor in Ukraine. Fact number four, Joe Biden goes to Ukraine on December 9th, 2015, gives the speech attacking the prosecutor that starts the process of getting that guy fired. Those facts, by the way, are consistent with what the confidential human source told the FBI and the FBI recorded in the 1023 form, the same form that the Justice Department didn't want to let this committee see. And all those facts 
All of that was further confirmed yesterday with the information that the Ways and Means Committee released from the whistleblowers Shapley and Ziegler. Here's a communication from Hunter Biden to an executive with Burisma. Devin and I do feel comfortable with Blue Star strategy, the, uh, strategies and the ability of Sally and Karen to deliver. Hunter Biden put Burisma in, in touch with Blue Star strategies. What were they going to deliver? Well, that was in a communication released yesterday as well. U.S. officials in Ukraine and in the United States need to express support for Burisma and Nikolai Zalsevsky to the highest level decision makers, the president of Ukraine, the president's chief of staff, and the prosecutor general. That's what they were going to deliver. And was they, were they successful? The interior minister confirmed that Zolachevsky is no longer wanted. We won in less than a year. Communications between the folks at Blue Star and Eric Sherwin, who was Hunter Biden's business partner. Uh, uh, partner. Awesome work. Congratulations to you guys. Those are the communications. That's what they got done. And remember, when this happens in October 2016, when, they, when the pressure is taken off, the case is dropped against Olachevsky. This is the second prosecutor. Joe Biden fired the first one. The second prosecutor comes in, drops the charges. That's exactly what they wanted done. And the final step, the final step is the Biden Justice Department tries to sweep it all under the rug. They slow walk the investigation. They let the statute of limitations lapse for the most important years, 14 and 15, the Burisma years when all that income's coming in. They try to put together this sweetheart deal and get it past the judge. And we learned yesterday in the search warrant, in the search warrant examining Hunter Biden's electronic communications, they weren't allowed to ask about political figure one. Political figure number one is the big guy, is Joe Biden. And they would have gotten away with it all. They would have gotten away with it all, except for two brave whistleblowers who sat in those seats two months ago and told their story. And their story has stood up. Two brave whistleblowers and a judge in Delaware who said, we're not going to let this happen. That's why we're here today. That's why this inquiry is so darn important. It's, as, it's a, the oldest story in the world, and those are the facts. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes. Mr. Dubinsky, I'm going to come to you quickly. A lot of talk about evidence. On the screens in the room, we have an organizational chart from the IRS investigative team that was looking into the business practices of Hunter Biden and his associates. This org chart is from 2014. Now, Mr. Dubinsky, when my former life, I was in community banking, and I'm, com I'm comfortable with looking at organizational charts. When I first saw this chart, the first thing I thought about was a real estate holding company or a developer, and this is not to demean developers in the great east state of America, but developers typically have multiple companies that float with various business interests and business lines. But the funny thing is that in the business dealings of Hunter Biden, there is no real estate, none at all. So, Mr. Dubinsky, in your professional experience, looking at this organizational chart of business structure, what do you see here? I see a very complicated structure of entities uh, that are interrelated and would give me concern. If I were an investigator, I would want to know what's going on in these entities, who's behind them, how's, how's the money moving between them, and what is the substance of the transactions? What's really going on here? Mr. Dubinsky, do you think it's in the, in the interest of this committee that is now in an inquiry phase to actually find out all of the... Uh, flow of money between these entities and what the purpose was? Absolutely. Uh, next slide, please. For my colleagues on the other side, we're gonna start talking evidence now. This is now a slide of the organizational chart of the Hunter Biden business, business uh, companies and, and with associates from 2018, from the same IRS investigators who were broke down the business structure in 2014. Does this slide cause you the same concern, Mr. Dubinsky? Yes, it does. Okay, now let's talk about some more, actually, one point I want to make on this, ladies and gentlemen, if, and I know it's kind of small, so I would love to submit, I will submit all this for the record. I would love my colleagues on the other side to see this. In 2014, one of the key owners was Devin Archer, who did testify and who did, was, uh, uh, was under deposition under oath by the oversight committee. In 2018, Devin Archer is no longer listed, but his wife, Krista Archer, is now listed. Mr. Dubinsky, when you see a situation where ownership interest moves from one spouse to the other, is that a concern of some level of 
fraud potentially? I, I would call it a red flag. That's something I would look at and, and, again, try to get to the bottom of what happened there. Was it just transferred? Was there money behind it? What was going on? Okay, thank you. Next slide. Now, this is to a text message. This is a text message um, between, uh, it's going to Naomi Biden. That's what this one is. Hold on, wait, so let me get my stuff back. There we go. Sorry. This is the WhatsApp text message between Jim Biden and Hunter Biden. In this text message, it clearly says, anyway, we can talk later, but you've been drawn into something purely for the purpose of protecting dad. This is between Hunter Biden and Jim Biden. Last time I checked, the father of Jim Biden and Joe Biden has now passed away. So I'm assuming this is Hunter Biden saying to Jim Biden, the president's brother, that you've been brought in this for the sole purpose of protecting dad. Miss O'Connor, do you think that this text message would lead this committee to get further information about the business dealings of Hunter Biden and how that actually links to Jim Biden, the president's brother, and why they are so concerned with protecting Dad, a.k.a. Joe Biden, a.k.a. the President of the United States? Yes. Thank you. Next slide, please. This is a text message between um, Hunter Biden and Naomi Biden. And it, this one is a famous one. Everybody knows this one. This is a famous one that says, I hope you all do what I did and pay for everything for this entire family for 30 years. It's really hard. But don't worry, unlike Pop, I won't, make you, I won't make you give me half your salary. Mr. Dubinsky, if you saw a text message like this in a potential money laundering operation or a potential pay-for-play operation, would you be looking for information related to money going from son to father? Absolutely, without a doubt. Thank you. Next slide. Oh, this is a fun one. Ladies and gentlemen, this one is from 2018. This is about four months before Joe Biden launched his campaign for president of the United States, December 2018. The highlight is, this is a text message between Jim Biden and Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden was in a bad way, by the way. He was, he was really strung out. He lost a bunch of money. He needed help. Jim Biden says, this can work. You need a safe harbor. I can work with your father alone. It'll probably take several months and everybody can read the text. Ms. O'Connor, Mr. Dubinsky, if you saw a text message like this between the president's brother and the president's son, wouldn't you be concerned about them trying to give plausible deniability for the president of the United States to not have any knowledge of said business dealings? It's worth Gentlemen, time's expired, but please answer the question. It's worth investigating. Mr. Dubinsky? I would agree. I would, I would investigate this. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yields back. Before I chair recognizes Ms. Mace from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in 2019, Representative Raskin didn't think a House vote was needed for an actual impeachment inquiry. And to quote uh, Representative Raskin, he said in 2019, there's no formal constitutional or statutory or even the House rule for how an impeachment inquiry is to begin. And so it means different things to different people. I don't want to hear another word from the left or anyone across the other side of the aisle about impeachment inquiry. This is complete and total hypocrisy this morning. Today, we're going to bring the facts. Today, we are going to bring the evidence. In 2017, the Joe Biden family teamed up with Chinese company CEFC to make millions off of granting access to Joe Biden. Hunter even arranged for Joe Biden to share office space with the CCP-aligned company CEFC. My Democrat colleagues say none of this is relevant because Joe Biden wasn't vice president while his family de did these shady deals. Turns out that's complete and total bullshit. It's a lie. Hunter Biden referred to access to his father as the keys to his family's only asset. Those words are going to come back and haunt Hunter Biden and his family forever. Yesterday, the Ways and Means Committee released an FBI memo on the interview they had with Tony Bobulinski, a former Biden partner in crime. I'll read a bit of that right now. The work conducted by CEFC, Gilear, Walker, Hunter Biden, James Biden, and Yee over the preceding two years was discussed in detail. In particular, CEFC was closing significant investment deals in Poland, Kazakhstan, Romania, Oman, and the Middle East during this period of time. Period of time is in reference to the years 2015 and 2016, when guess what? Joe Biden was vice president. 
As an aside, Rob Walker in previous testimony also confirmed that Joe Biden attended a meeting with the head of CEFC. So now we know CEFC was working with the Biden family while Joe Biden was vice president. And I'll continue reading from Tony Bobulinski's report which says, and I quote Bobolinsky, Hunter Biden and James Biden did not receive compensation because Joe Biden was still vice president during this time period. There is a concern it would be improper for payments to be made to Hunter Biden and James Biden by CEFC due to its close affiliation with the Chinese government. Hunter Biden and James Biden both wanted to be compensated for the assistance they had provided to CEFC's ventures. In particular, they believe CEFC owed them money for the benefits that accrued to CEFC through its use of the Biden family name to advance their business dealings. The Bidens, coincidentally, were paid over a million dollars by CCP-affiliated Chinese company CEFC shortly after Joe Biden left office as vice president. Now we know why, because it was back pay. I'm gonna show another image. This is a text message between Hunter Biden and Gong Wen Dong, an agent of CEFC. Hunter says, my uncle will be here with his brother, in all caps, who would like to say hello to the chairman. He goes on, Jim's brother, if he's coming, wants to say hello. His uncle's brother, hmm. I wonder who that could be. I can't quite figure it out. Hunter puts brother in all caps, and it doesn't take a genius to figure this out, but since I'm not always dealing with geniuses, and Washington, D.C. Has, has been illustrated today, I'll spell it out. The brother of Hunter, Hunter's uncle, Jim, is Joe Biden. Why was Hunter so secretive about his father? I'm gonna tell you why. It's because Joe Biden didn't want the American people to know he and his family were getting paid millions and millions of dollars from a company closely tied to the Chinese Communist Party. CEFC knew paying Biden family members was bad, so they covered it up. Hunter knew Joe Biden hanging out with CCP businessmen would be a bad look, so he tried to pull a genius move on us with this whole my uncle's brother bullshit. We already know the president took bribes from Burisma. I also want to add, betraying your country is treason. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record this text message between Hunter Biden and Gan Wing Dong and the FBI memo regarding their interview with Tony Bobulinski, showing Joe Biden's connections to CFC during his vice presidency. Without objection, so ordered. Professor Turley, we got 30 seconds. In your experience in reviewing cases of fraud, do people who are conducting legitimate business usually go through these efforts and hoops to keep their foreign entanglements hidden? Yes, the, the, the issue with, with, with influence peddling is that um, it can, in some circumstances, be legal, but it's not something that necessarily is made public. The public does not buy into the idea that you can sell your family brand if it's influence peddling. So what happens with influence peddling is that you often have the commission of crimes that conceal it. Uh, and to take steps so that it's not public. That may include, but it's not necessarily the reason in this case, but it may include the failure to pay taxes, the failure to register as a foreign agent. And part of the purpose of an inquiry is to see if there is a linkage between those acts and more importantly, a linkage to the president. Can I briefly respond to the earlier attack? Uh, you may have additional questions. I don't want to take your time. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, I, I'm sorry, the gentlelady's over time, okay. but we'll work with you on that because I do think you need to respond to that ridiculous uh, statement. Now, Chair Reckon it's from Wisconsin. Okay, I'm concerned about the seriousness of these allegations. Um, and what, what bothers me a little is that I'm beginning to think Americans are, are beginning to think this behavior by the, by the Biden family is normal. Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of afraid that they're going to say, well, President Biden's a politician. They're going to look at the news with regard to uh, Senator Menendez the last couple of weeks, and they're just going to say this is how it works. I don't think it's the way it works. I think this is uh, this corruption that appears to be, we have all sorts of smoke, maybe not fire, but all sorts of smoke, uh, is almost an historic low for our country, and it deserves a strong response from this body. Um, look at Senator Menendez's latest indictment. There's no tolerance for putting yourself before your constituents, unless it seems your last name is Biden. Um, I applaud my Democrat colleagues who've asked Senator Menendez to resign, but we know how that ends. There'll be a new Democrat to replace him, no political risk. 
Um, but here we're talking about the presidency. Um, if, if the response is, well, Hunter Biden was an elected politician, I have to know just what was president, what was Hunter Biden selling. We can't become numb, numb to these facts. These, the allegations are extraordinary. In fact, I'm not aware of these type of allegations where we have a sitting president accused of bribery, accused of taking payments, whether it be directly or through his family. And these are not empty allegations. We continue to have evidence. Just look at what's come in just the past couple of days. Is President Biden compromised? It's particularly relevant because of um, the, the interaction between our country and Ukraine, interaction between our country, country and China. Doesn't look good, and the facts demand we continue to investigate. Mr. Turley, I want you to, I want you to really discuss how historic this really is. What do you well, think is the most? What, what do you think is the most concerning piece of evidence that you heard of today? I think the most concerning. Obviously, you have to start with the bribery allegation that was the subject of the uh, FD uh, 1023. Now, I, I say in the testimony that you have to only take that so far because you don't. You have a lot of information about sec a secondhand account, but when you put it into the context of this labyrinth of accounts and companies used to, sh to transfer money, and you have the statements of Hunter Biden, that's what makes this a credible inquiry. And the question is, did the president know? Did he encourage this type of corruption? And the, the key here, once again, which is what I stress in the testimony, is you have to begin with a recognition that what Hunter Biden and his associates were doing was corrupt. That's what influence peddling is. It's a, it's a form of corruption that our country globally has combated. Now, the only question is, uh, for an inquiry is whether that body of corruption, which it is, also encompass the actions or the knowledge of the President of the United States. The only way you will be able to get that information is to follow this evidence. And what I suggest is you do so uh, without any prejudice, you do so without any assumptions. In fact, I hope that the president will be able to show that there is no such nexus. Uh, but you won't get those answers until you ask these questions. So we're really obligated to have this inquiry. I believe it's your duty to determine if there is, if the president is involved in what is a known form of corruption. And that's what I believe has already been described. I believe many people have accepted that this was influence peddling uh, in its rawest uh, form. Okay, could you, could you um, elaborate for us uh, the impact bribery of, public, of, of a public official can have on the execution of their duties? Uh, and how about if it was the president? Can you explain why the American public ought to care about this? Well, you know, Alexander Hamilton talked about impeachment in, in Federalist 65 as a violation of the public trust. And that's really what this ultimately goes to. I'm hoping that there's not much disagreement that public corruption falls within an impeachable offense, because if it does not, uh, then it makes a mockery of what the framers were talking about. You know, during the Clinton uh, impeachment, Michael and I testified, and there was a lot of, I think, good faith discussion between us and the other experts as to the executive function theory and, and what, that, what constitutes an impeachable offense. I would hope that it would be agreed that if a nexus was established with the president, that he participated in the corruption of influence peddling, that it would be a potential impeachable uh, uh, um, offense, or it would be a, the basis okay. of, of an of We, we have millions of dollars uh, flowing to the Biden family. That's been proven overwhelmingly. Are you aware of any precedent in this country uh, where there's been any case of bribery and corruption of a public official or of a president of this magnitude? I mean, is there any historical precedent in this country where on Gentlemen's time's expired, but please answer the question, Mr. Turley. Certainly, the, the, this has the assumption, as the ranking member, you know, has contested the degree to which the uh, all of this money went to the to the Biden family members. That has to be, as the ranking member said, it has to be established. 
But no, in terms of the figures, um, yeah, I've been a critic of influence peddling by both Republicans and Democrats for three decades. I've been writing about this a long time. Influence peddling is the favorite form of corruption in Washington, D.C., and, and this city is awash with it. But have I seen anything of this size and complexity? No. It just as an observer, no. I, but we still need to know the scope of this and whether all of these financial transfers link the president in any regard, and I'm not going to assume that it does. Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous Chair Neal recognizes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joe Biden had dinner with Hunter and his business associates, including Yelena Baterina, a Russian tech and energy oligarch who was married to the mayor of M Moscow at the time. Hunter then received $3.5 million in payouts from Baterina. She was not sanctioned after the invasion of Crimea. Joe Biden has maintained for years that he was not involved in his son's business dealings. Yet we have proof that Joe Biden attended business dinners with his son while he was Vice President of the United States of America. Here you have an excerpt from Devin Archer's transcribed interview. On the screen, if we could get that up there. During his interview, Archer testified to the fact that on multiple occasions, then Vice President Joe Biden attended functions with business associates of his and Hunter Biden. One such example is laid out on the screen for us. Mr. Archer is explaining here that in the spring of 2014, if we could get this slide up, Devin and Hunter had dinner at Cafe Milano with several of their business associates. One of these attendees was Yelena Baterina. Miss Baterina was, at the time, the richest woman in Russia, and she was married to the former mayor of Moscow, as previously stated. Interestingly, on February 14th, 2014, Miss Baterina wired Hunter Biden and Devin Archer $3.5 million. It is still uncertain what legitimate service Hunter Biden provided to Miss Baterina in exchange for this large sum of money, if any at all. Furthermore, it is concerning how Hunter Biden and Devin Archer moved this money from bank account to bank account. And it is also convenient that the U.S. government never placed Ms. Baterina on their public sanctions list after Russia invaded Crimea. This billionaire continued to invade public sanctions lists even after Russia invaded Ukraine. I want these facts to be clear to the American people. The billionaire continued to evade the public sanctions lists after Russia invaded Ukraine. Joe Biden's attendance at this dinner shows that Joe Biden's involvement in Hunter Biden's deals was more than just the illusion of access. It was access. There were direct benefits leading to Hunter and his business partners after Joe's attendance at this Cafe Milano dinner. This pay-to-play type of engagement was selling direct access to Joe Biden and the office of the Vice President of the United States. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter to the record the third bank records memorandum produced by this committee on oversight and accountability on August 9th, 2023. Without objection, to ordered. Mr. Turley, as an expert on constitutional issues and impeachment, where does selling access to an executive office fall in terms of what justifies an impeachment inquiry and what is deemed an impeachable offense? Well, it's two separate questions. What I've suggested is for the four uh, areas for articles of impeachment that you can explore, you can look at some of the criminal code, and that includes things like bribery under 201, Hobbs, uh, the Hobbs Act cases, uh, and those have different standards that I think are relevant. In terms of the impeachable uh, standard itself, there's been obviously decades of debate about that. I would hope that there would be general agreement that, that public corruption 
if the president engaged selling any access right if the, yes. if, the, if, the, if he engaged in public corruption involved any sort of involved. peddling of influence uh, now as a follow up in previous impeachment inquiries um, have actions such as influence peddling and pay to play schemes like this been deemed uh, as offensive uh, to the to the conscience of the american people in such a way to warrant an investigation well, I think that there's certainly a basis for this inquiry to go forward. There's, you know, my my position is simply that I, I, this is early on in, in an inquiry in terms of linking these, which are are still just allegations, to the president, and that's the linkage you have to establish. Thank, thank you, Mr. Turley. It is far time for Joe Biden to stop lying to the American people about his shady foreign business deals. He intentionally misled the American people by using complex maneuvers to pocket millions of dollars from our adversary. He lied when he was vice president. He lied as a candidate to gain the office of president of the United States. Now this committee has uncovered the truth and it is time to impeach this compromised commander in chief. Mr. Chairman, I yield. The lady yields back. Mr. Chairman, uh, point of order, if I could. I, I didn't want to interrupt the, the good gentlelady from Colorado, but um, you cannot engage in personalities against the President of the United We've States. We've established that, Mr. That, Ranking Member. Thank okay, you. and so you cannot say that Joe Biden lied. First of all, he didn't lie. Mr. But Ranking Member, we've established that at the beginning of the hearing. You, you, you can't say it, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. I hope this you agree is, with me. This, this is, this is, parliamentarian. This is, thank I can you, provide you all, all thank the cases. This is, this. I have a Reclaiming order. Chair now recognize Mr. Ivey. I have a unanimous consent motion yeah, before Mr. Yes, Ivey goes. Mr. Um, I, I would like to uh, reintroduce once again the Devin Archer transcript and especially point to when he says look, look, that Hunter look, Mr. Biden Goldman, was Mr. not Goldman, involved we, we've re in the four, This will be the fifth time. Without objection, dollars. we've re-entered the Devin Archer transcript for the fifth time. Now, Chair, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very disturbed about what I've heard here today. There's a saying among country lawyers that if you have the facts, you pound the facts. If you don't have the facts, you pound the table. When you can't pound the table, I guess some of my Democratic colleagues choose to pound the witnesses. That was inexcusable. Um, what just happened to this committee attacking the witnesses personally instead of addressing the merits of the evidence being presented indicates to me that my Democratic colleagues know the evidence is becoming increasingly conclusive. It reminds me of a line from a movie, A Few Good Men, Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth. The evidence will either convict or quit in any criminal proceeding or, or civil proceeding. If there's no wrongdoing, the evidence or the lack of evidence will support that conclusion. The problem of the suspicion of wrongdoing is compounded by the withholding of evidence the misrepresentation of the evidence in hand, and the obstruction of an investigation but not denying access to information that would be or could be evidence. At this point, there's a growing public perception, and it's reflected in the polls, Mr. Chairman, that President Biden, his son Hunter, other family members, and business associates were engaged in some form of criminal activity. It is the responsibility of this committee to pursue the truth and, and report it to the American people. I'm not sure that's what's happening on the other side with my colleagues. It is vitally important that our efforts be conducted openly, without prejudice, with no other agenda other than arriving at the truth regardless of our politics. It is vitally important. As, Mr. As Professor Turley has pointed out, you don't undertake an impeachment inquiry lightly. This is, has profound implications for the future of this country and our ability to govern ourselves. We have seen repeatedly obstructive efforts, obstruction efforts, to deny this committee access to information that's material to this investigation. Now, I want to ask Professor Turley a, a question. In your view, could the promise of foreign access to any uh, official, government official, whether it's the vice president or anybody else, that uh, only materially benefited a family member, could that be influence peddling? Uh, yes, and, and as I point out in the testimony, 
uh, courts have found that various benefits to family members can be attributed as a benefit to the principal. That has included everything from throwing a golf contest in the favor of a son of a politician to uh, paying for uh, gifts. In fact, I was lead counsel in the last uh, Porteous trial, in the last impeachment trial for a judge. And um, that was the trial in the U.S. Senate. My client, Judge Porteous, was accused, among other things, of benefits going to his family. And so there's, there's certainly precedent, not only in criminal cases, but in impeachment cases for making that next. Okay, I want to be more specific. If Vice President Biden used his office to influence domestic or foreign policy for the financial benefit of his son, even though Vice President Biden may never have received a dime, but it resulted in millions of dollars going to his son or his brother or other family members or business associates and used his office to influence either domestic or foreign policy for their benefit, could that be a violation of the public trust? Absolutely. In fact, it's, it's perhaps the most quintessential violation of the public trust because you're not acting in the public's interest. It's a form of public corruption that this government, this country, uh, has declared as corrupt in other countries around the world. Uh, sir, would it, it, Mr. Langworthy from New York for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for years, we have heard shifting denials and deflections from President Biden relating to his son's foreign business deals and ventures. Uh, in fact, we know that President Biden has lied to the American people at least 16 times about his family's business schemes. Uh, in August 2019, Joe Biden told reporters, quote, first of all, I have never discussed with my son or my brother or anyone else anything having to do with their business, period, end quote. Joe Biden continued to double down on this statement throughout the 2020 presidential race. In September 2019, Joe Biden again stated, I've never spoken to my son about his overseas business dealings. These lies continued throughout the 2020 presidential race. It was only recently that the Biden administration has grudgingly begun to shift their answer on what Joe Biden knew about his son's foreign business deals. In June of this year, the White House changed its position by claiming that the president was not in business with his son. Moreover, media and members across the aisle continue to run cover for President Biden, repeatedly shifting the goalpost and repeatedly peddling the notion that Hunter Biden was selling the, quote, illusion of access. Evidence discovered by this committee in its investigation into the Biden brand, however, has revealed Hunter's product went well beyond illusions of access. On display is an example of actual access to the then vice president. During his transcribed interview, Devin Archer was questioned about how many times Hunter Biden had put his father on speakerphone while in business meetings. Now, Archer made it clear during this whole 10-year partnership that Joe Biden was on speakerphone maybe 20 times while Archer was present. And when later interviewed by Tucker Carlson, Archer went on to say, if you're sitting with a foreign business person and then you hear the voice of the vice president, that's prize enough. That's pretty impactful stuff. Archer later stated, in the rear view, it's an abuse of soft power. Now, President Biden's involvement in Hunter's business deals was not overt. Joe Biden did not email Hunter asking for Burisma's quarterly reports. All it takes for Biden to be involved in Hunter's business dealings is Biden crafting and implementing policy based on promptings from his son and receiving payment in return. Uh, Mr. Turley, have you ever had your parents call in during an official business meeting? <laughs> uh, no. Okay. Uh, members across the aisle have characterized Hunter's speaker phone calls during business meetings as, quote, casual conversation and niceties uh, about the weather and what's going on. Now, during, business, during a business meeting, have you ever answered a call from a parent or put them on speaker and then proceeded to discuss the weather? Not in my case, no. Okay. Would, would you say that such actions are generally out of the ordinary in the business world? I couldn't speak for the whole business world, but it strikes me as being odd. Yeah. Uh, looking at the evidence like this transcript of Devin Archer's testimony and other evidence discussed in today's hearings, can you contrast the level of thoroughness of this committee's investigation compared with the Democrats' impeachment inquiry in 2019? Well, I was highly critical of the, uh, obviously, the Trump impeachment in 
uh, the first Trump impeachment, uh, which uh, I felt did not develop a sufficient record to support the articles. I actually said that the investigation had merit to go forward, but that they hadn't established the basis for the articles. In the second impeachment, they used what I called a snap impeachment. They just, uh, they jettisoned any uh, hearing at all, which I think did do damage to the impeachment process. Now, looking at this transcript of Devin Archer's sworn testimony, would you agree that there are inconsistencies with President Biden's statements that he never discussed business with his son or even later that he was not in business with his son? Well, I think uh, my understanding is that Devin Archer himself was asked that question and said that it was patently false. Uh, to suggest that uh, President Biden was not aware of his son's business dealings. Very good. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I, I would yield. Chair recognized Mr. Timmons from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to try to simplify this for the American people. My colleagues across the aisle allege that this inquiry is improper and that this hearing is improper. But that could not be further from the truth. We now have enormous amounts of evidence indicate that Hunter Biden was engaged in nefarious and illegal activities with foreign nationals from China, Romania, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Russia, all while making millions of dollars doing so. We don't even know the full extent of it yet. To date, we've discovered up to 25 million in payments, and that's without even having Hunter Biden's personal bank records. The question is this, though. This is the question. This is why we're here. What did Joe Biden know and when? Due to the evidence that we found to date, Speaker McCarthy appropriately initiated an impeachment inquiry to give us additional tools to get the answer to that question. Based on the circumstantial evidence we have, the laptop, the whistleblower, shell companies, bank records, and testimony from Devin Archer, this Congress has a duty to further investigate whether Vice President Joe Biden was an affable, loving father, simply taken advantage of by his delinquent son, or a knowing participant who was complicit in the scheme and financially compensated for his role. That is why we are here today, to answer that simple question, to determine if our current president is compromised. Look, this scheme is complicated. You get all these countries and all these different roles different people played, but, but the plan is simple and repeated often. A foreign client has a problem. The foreign client pays a Biden. The vice president leverages influence to force favorable outcomes for the client. The Biden family earns their fee. That's the scheme. We've seen it played over and over. As we continue to investigate all of this wrongdoing, I've put a lot of time trying to figure out how all this got started. In 2014, it seems that Vice President Biden, after four decades of public service and thinking he would never hold public office again, started down a slippery slope. Perhaps he just wanted to help his struggling son. Maybe he never intended to sell policy decisions and for the Biden family to get millions of dollars. But there's mounting evidence that suggests that, he, that that may very be what has happened. It all began in the spring of 2014, though. Hunter Biden gets his father to have dinner with foreign nationals and his business partner, Devin Archer, in Georgetown. The foreign nationals attending this dinner were Karim Masimov, the prime minister of Kazakhstan, Kenneth Rakashev, a Kazakhstani oligarch, Yelena Baterina, a Russian oligarch who also happened to be the wife of the mayor of Moscow. We know that beginning in early 2014, Baterina sent a $3.5 million wire to one of Hunter Biden's shell companies, and Rakashev wired $142,300 to yet another shell company for Hunter Biden to buy a Porsche. We have the bank records to prove this. So the logical question here is, what was this money for? What were the goals of those payments? For Baterina, it seems, her motives were clear. She knew that uh, Russia was gonna, investigate, was gonna invade Crimea, and as a response to the invasion, the Obama administration would inevitably announce sanctions and visa bans. Who's left off the list of, that the Obama administration published? Who was noticeably missing? Elena Baterina, the richest woman in Russia, the woman who wired Hunter Biden $3.5 million just days earlier. That's just a coincidence. For Rakashev, the motive was to leverage Biden's influence to aid in the facilitation of the sale of Kazakhstani state oil rights to Burisma. And guess what? In December of the same year, Rakashev's oil company in Burisma joined a Chinese Communist Party-linked company and announced a deal. Everyone got rich. Again, another amazing coincidence. These are only the first two of dozens of examples of the scheme. A foreign client has a problem. A foreign client pays a Biden. Vice President leverages influence to force a favorable outcome for the client. Biden family earns their fee. Our work over the last nine months warrants additional scrutiny of Biden family members and business associates and requires additional tools at our disposal to uncover whether Joe Biden was complicit. Again, the purpose of this investigation. Our next steps are to subpoena additional documents that will give context to these transactions to help determine Joe Biden's culpability. We're going to subpoena Hunter Biden's personal bank records 
various business records such as invoices and contracts to clarify what these payments were for, secret service logs detailing movement patterns of then vice president. The list goes on and on. And again, I just want everybody to remember, we're doing this because the Department of Justice, the FBI and the IRS refuse to do their job. And we have evidence just in the last week that they're actively concealing these possible crimes. If we discover that Joe Biden was taking half of Hunter Biden's income, like Hunter told his daughter in a text message, I hope that my Democrat colleagues will put politics aside, do the right thing, and join us in impeaching a corrupt president who sold out the American people. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. House Republicans are working through an impeachment inquiry to hold this administration accountable. Yesterday, we heard from expert witnesses who said that there is enough evidence for an impeachment inquiry. Jonathan Turley, he said, and I quote, I do believe that the House passed the threshold for an impeachment inquiry into the conduct of Joe Biden. Bruce Dubunsky, the forensic accountant, as a fraud investigator, when I see smoke, I immediately look for the fire. Why were members of the Biden family and close business associates receiving millions of dollars of payments from foreign entities and individuals? Republicans have been uncovering the Biden family culture of corruption, and we will follow the facts wherever they lead. Again, remember, as the president ran for office, he told us he's never talked to his son about any of the business. We now know that's a lie. Not only did he make phone calls in, he had meetings. There were benefits for those dinners. A new Porsche, more than $3 million from a Russian oligarch, travels to nine family members. As Chairman Comer announced, we are moving forward with subpoenas for Hunter and James Biden's personal and business bank records. The American people deserve to know the truth. And that's exactly what we're doing. This is not impeachment. This is empowers the House to get the facts, to answer the questions the American people were wondering. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our chairman. Point of order right away. Right away. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Biggs. What's your Mr. point? Mr. Chairman, when uh, a member of the committee uh, impugns the integrity of a witness is that uh, uh, against the rules to allow those uh, those witnesses to respond to that uh, malicious statement. I'm quoting the. I, look, I, I'm asking. I'm not asking you. I'm asking the chairman. I've yeah. asked for a ruling on that. Mr. Chairman, he can use his own time to question any witness he wants. I, I was recognized on a point of order. Do, point of order. What's your point? I, I mean, my, my point is that it was I'd the way we ruling the way on my have, point of order. The way first. we've always proceeded. I'd ask for my ruling, a ruling on my point of order. Mr. First. Chairman, in I'd order ask to rehabilitate. Ruling on my point of Mr. order. Mr. Chairman, first. okay. Here, here's the here's the ruling. The witnesses have the opportunity to address that during a line of questioning. If you, if Mr. Turley wants to address that during another member's line of questioning, then then he's more than welcome to do that. Uh, re remind everyone, we're on our five minute clock, and now. The chair recognizes me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. President Biden has, has sent over $110 billion of taxpayers' hard-earned money to Ukraine and wants to send even more. Yet his son failed to pay any taxes on the millions of dollars he received from Ukrainian companies. Many folks in East Tennessee can't afford to buy any of their dadgum groceries, let alone a home or an automobile. But these decent people and Americans all over the country still pay their taxes. The fact is, if your last name is Biden, you don't have to pay, play by the same rules. Who's going to write the check for the money Hunter Biden didn't pay now that it's too late to bring charges to these taxpayers? Who's, who's paying taxes on the 250000 that China sent to President Biden's Delaware address? I'll tell you who. It's the hardworking Americans that got to get up every morning that don't come into work at 10 o'clock and take two hours for lunch and then walk out of here in their Brooks Brothers suit with their jacket thrown over their dadgum shoulder claiming that they worked hard because they know they didn't work hard. The people back home are working hard, and they're paying their dadgum taxes. Yet, the Biden family doesn't have to. This past July, two high-level IRS agents, Gary Shapley and Joseph Ziegler, testified before our committee. They painted a very disturbing picture, worse than the one of Hunter Biden's paintings, by the way, of misconduct and obstruction within the Department of Justice criminal investigation of Hunter Biden, the Biden family business dealings. They testified that Hunter Biden should have been charged with a tax felony, not a misdemeanor, 
Hunter was, was saved by Merrick Garland's decision to change the department's longstanding policy to charge the most serious offense that can be proven. This paved the path for Hunter Biden to attempt to plead guilty for two tax-related misdemeanors rather than any of the six felonies recommended by the department's tax division. I've literally seen people in Tennessee be charged with more for, for traffic violations. Moreover, Mr. Garland's decision does not align with Chapter 10 of the Criminal Tax Manual, which prohibits prosecutors from allowing a defendant to plead to a misdemeanor when elements of a felony can be proven. David Weiss should have followed department policy and charged Hunter Biden with, with tax felonies. The Department of Justice should have ensured Hunter paid his back taxes, just like any other person in this position. Hardworking Tennesseans shouldn't have to subsidize the Biden family's crime spree. I'd like to know that any of them paid any of their dadgum taxes. I yield the remainder of my time to my friend from Ohio, Jim Jordan. Mr. Turley, Professor, we're going to be moving quickly here. Let us, uh, let us retract from the absurdities of 21st century Twitter. Let's go back to 1787, shall we? Article 2, Section 4, the President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. But high crimes and misdemeanors is not and never has been limited to indictable criminality. 
Um, Mr. Turley, Professor, please tell us briefly, sir, what was the actual meaning in 1787 of high crimes and misdemeanors? Well, this has been a matter of obviously robust debate for uh, many decades. What we do know is that there were various terms that were offered and were rejected, uh, the most famous being maladministration, and James Madison was un uncomfortable with that. But they were also uncomfortable with limiting it to like treason and bribery. Exactly. It was never designed to be, to be limited by, by writ of statute, was it, Professor? Would Madison... Would Madison argue that, quote unquote, betrayal of trust to foreign powers is an impeachable offense? There are references into that, that type of betrayal of, of trust, but also if you take a look at past impeachments, uh, they have gone to the violation of public trust, including the use of office uh, to perpetuate false accounts or to obstruct this uh, body. Agreed, so in, in, impeachment is a, is a mechanism of our congressional authority. It's not, a, it's not a criminal proceeding, is it, Professor? It's not. What I've said previously is that I happen to believe you should start with the criminal code and look at things that would be crimes for others because those resonate the most. In terms and though, and those, those criminal code violations would be revealed through the investigative effort of the congressional endeavor to, to inquire into impeachable offenses like that, this, like this hearing. Would you agree? That's right. This is the moving part. quickly. <laughs> there's, there's uh, one of the gentlemen said there's no credibility to this evidence. Let me say, as an investigator, there's perhaps no category of evidence that's more credible than bank records. And bank records is what we're working with. The House Oversight Committee, Judiciary Committee, Ways and Means Committee are investigating highly suspicious money transactions. From, from foreign powers through shell companies to Biden family members. There's nothing more credible in an investigative effort, good sir, than bank records. Um, I'm going to read from an email from Assistant United States Attorney Wolf, released by the House Committee on Ways and Means yesterday, identified as Exhibit 202 of the IRS whistleblower investigation. This email shows Ms. Wolf prohibiting the investigation team from looking into political figure one. Let me clarify that during that investigation, political figure one was the pseudonym agreed upon by the investigative team, the FBI, the DOJ, an IRS investigator. Political figure one is not a pseudonym created by Republicans or Democrats. Political figure one is President Biden, is Joe Biden. Leslie Wolf, as a priority, someone needs to redraft attachment B. There should be nothing about political figure one in here. This is a response to an email delivered by Joshua Wilson, FBI agent, that said, please see the attached draft for Blue Star search warrant. Blue Star Strategies is a longtime Democrat lobbying firm that Hunter Biden used to put pressure on U.S. government officials to end the investigation and protect Burisma. The Department of Justice was investigating Blue Star for these activities and allowed to retroactively register as a foreign agent. Today, no one has been held accountable at Blue Star. That happened during 2020, just months before your presidential election, America. You should be very concerned about this. Mr. Turley, based upon the constitutional parameters of the House of Representatives, do you agree that our Oversight Committee, Judiciary Committee, and Ways and Means Committee should be judiciously investigating uh, reasonable suspicion of impeachable actions by President Joe Biden? I do. I, that, I think it is your duty to get answers to these questions and to see if the president was involved in what I think is a confirmed uh, corrupt influence peddling sure. effort. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. I yield. When yields back in our last questioner, Mr. Armstrong from North Dakota. You know, we spend all day long talking about evidence and proof and different definitions and all of those different things, and we spend the days talking about unconditional love for sons and addiction, all of these different issues, but I think we miss one of the points in that this was going on for years, and this was going on for years with various different companies, 
uh, during the course of Joe Biden's vice presidency, after his vice presidency, and at least during his candidacy for president. Let me use one example out of many. In 2015, Hunter Biden and James Bartard start, started working with CEFC, which is a Chinese company, energy company with direct ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Now, there's evidence that they delayed payment until after Joe Biden was no longer vice president, so too as to assume uh, no appearance of impropriety. In 2017, after Joe, Joe Biden left office, Hunter wants to get paid by the Chinese Communist Party. And in July 4th of 2017, there is a meeting in Moscow between Vladimir Putin and President Xi where the chairman of the CEFC, which is a Chinese energy party, was present. And it's talking about a large-scale oil and gas purchase of a company called Rosnet by the Chinese Communist Party. Now, on, on July 30th of 2017, there's a text with Hunter Biden and the members of CEFC. And that text reads, if I get a call or text from anyone involved other than you, Zhang or the chairman, I will make certain that between the man sitting next to me and every person he knows and my ability to ever, forever hold a grudge that you will regret not following that direction. The people he's talking in, this guy disappeared. He's either been killed or he has not been seen since 2018. That is true. And on August 30th, there's another, or August 3rd, there's another text. And I'm tired of this, Kevin. I can make $5 million in salary at any law firm in America. If you think this is about money, it's not. The Bidens are the best I know at doing exactly what the chairman wants from this partnership. Please do not quibble over peanuts. We've talked about influence peddling. We've talked about all of this. This is a shakedown. Like, we can use whatever terms we want. This is a threat. And they believed it, because the next day they sent $100,000. Do you think they were scared of Hunter Biden? I don't know. I think we should find out. And it matters, because on 9-17 of the same year, there is, a, there is a deal done between the Chinese Communist Party and Russia for a 17% sale of Rosneft. And we continue to go through all of those things. And now, finally, in December of 2018, a year, over a year later, there's another text. So we're not talking about a speeding ticket, Mr. Gerhardt. We're just not. You're right, Hallie, and I find myself because I've chosen to alienate all of my friends and family and employees, and you and the kids and my kids, et cetera, very alone in dealing with rebuilding an income that support an enormous alimony and my kids and costs and myself, dealing with the aftermath of the abduction and likely assassination, that's what the New York Times suspects, of my business partner, the richest man in the world. The arrest and conviction of my client, the chief of intelligence of the People's Republic of China by the US government, the retaliation of the Chinese in the ouster and arrest of a U.S. suspected CIA operative inside China, my suspected involvement in brokering a deal with Vladimir Putin directly for the largest sale of oil and gas assets inside Russia to China, a tax bill that left Eric, Eric left hanging over my head, and oh, by the way, my dad is running for president. Mr. Turley, given the evidence we have, would the next step in this investigation be to subpoena Hunter Biden or James Biden's bank records? Yes, in my testimony, I do warn the committee that once you proceed along the impeachment, the Constitution is on your side, but the calendar is not. Uh, you have to uh, quickly determine if this information is going to be withheld so that you can seek judicial review. And that's one of the things that I encourage you to do so that uh, you certainly don't, you should not tarry uh, in, a, in an impeachment inquiry. Ms. O'Connor, you agree with that? Completely. I wish I could have said it as well. Mr. Dublinsky, you're a forensic accountant. Would you like to see those bank records? A absolutely. Here's the thing, and this is the bottom line. If the Vice President Biden knew or helped or engaged in any conduct that in any way, while well, he knew his son was involved in, that was helping move forward the, the interests of Russia and China, our two strategic adversaries on the world stage, the American people deserve to know. If the former vice president was doing the same thing or knew his son was doing it or helped in any meaningful way, the American people deserve to know. And if the presidential candidate for the Democratic Party in 2019 knew about any of those things, the American people deserve to know. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, can I get a timeline from you on, on your thoughts about impeachment? Uh, Chairman Comer has suggested that his investigation is winding down. Do you feel right now that there is enough evidence to move on articles of impeachment? And how quickly could we see that process play out? And if you've already decided 
that you're heading towards articles of impeachment, or is there more that you need to see? So <clears throat> many of you know my background. I'm a constitutional law attorney. I, I, I believe this is a very serious matter. I, I was called upon to serve on the impeachment defense team in the House twice under President Trump when the Democrats used it for raw partisan political purposes, and I decried that at each uh, step of the way. The reason is because the impeachment power that we have in the Constitution, in the House specifically, next to a declaration of war, you could argue it's the most, it's the heaviest power that we have, and it cannot be wielded for political purposes. So I have been very consistent, uh, intellectually consistent in this, and, 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 uh, and persistent, that we have to follow due process, and we have to follow the law. That means following our obligation under the Constitution and, and doing appropriate investigations in the right way, at the right pace, so that the evidence comes in and we follow the evidence where it leads. We follow the truth where it leads. So as we stand here today, I'm not predetermined that, but I do believe that very soon we are coming to a point of decision on it. We're in the impeachment inquiry phase, as you know, which is an important step in that due process. And what you're seeing right now, although a lot of American people are anxious about this, many you know, Republicans across the country are anxious to get to the end point on this, and I think some Democrats want to know how it ends as well. What you're seeing right now is a deliberate constitutional process that was envisioned by the founders, the framers of the Constitution. This is how they envisioned this to go, not the way the Democrats did it, snap impeachments, sham impeachments, and all the rest. So I, I, know, that, um, I know that people are, are anxious about it, but I will say – uh, Chairman Comer, Chairman Jordan in Judiciary, uh, Chairman Smith in Ways and Means, they've done an extraordinary job, very methodically, and I, I would say outside the scope of politics, they've been taking in the evidence as it goes. So we're going to follow the evidence where it leads, and we'll see. And I, I'm not going to predetermine it this morning. Mr. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Scott, Mr. Speaker. Somebody in the music room must have thought I'd like pro wrestling. <laughs> they were correct. I love pro wrestling. <laughs> Being a fan of, of pro wrestling, of Triple H, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, that is the thing that prepares you for Congress, because Congress is nothing but sports entertainment. So how's everybody doing today? We've had a lot of speakers come to this podium. I've heard the cheers. I've heard some boos. That's all right. You know, we're, you know, in our party, we, we can boo each other too. It happens. Somebody else is coming later tonight. I think you know who that is. Oh, so he likes him. You like him. You like him who's coming up. I like him, too. Before I came into the, to the stage, I had a meeting with uh, the Israeli Council General and with the family whose loved ones are still being held by Hamas terrorists in Gaza. And you can see, obviously, from not just a family perspective, but from their humanity, how much they are concerned and they fear for the lives of their father, their mother, their sister, and their nephew, who are all being held by Hamas terrorists. The job of this president and of the United States and of Israel is to do everything possible to bring those hostages home. But the other job for the IDF and for Israel with our full support is to completely obliterate and destroy Hamas. This kind of terror, this kind of barbarism cannot be allowed to exist the weak foreign policy from Tony Blinken and Joe Biden, the fecklessness brought to us by Barack Obama, can no longer be America's foreign policy. You know, we had a guy, I affectionately refer to him as 45. But we had a guy who didn't want to be in endless wars. He didn't want that. He didn't want 
the American people to be lied to about intelligence. He wanted our troops to be safe. He wanted them to be paid and cared for. But he also understood that if it were the mullahs in Iran or anybody else, if they stepped out of line, they got what was coming to them. You see, I like an American foreign policy, frankly, to how you deal with your friends and with your families. Like, those are my friends. I see them in the front row right now. I got their back. They have mine. I'm a nice guy. I smile a lot. I'm very friendly. In this game of politics and the sports entertainment of the political world, a lot of stuff happens. People say things about one another. You guys know what I'm talking about. But that's within the confines of what we do. But the second you go after my family, the second you go after my friends, the smile goes away. And with our countries who are our allies, namely Israel, we can talk to you, we'll be diplomatic, but when you have barbarians use hang gliders to kill young people at a music festival, when they go into the kibbutz in southern Israel and they chop off the heads of babies and they rape women and they basically tie up men and shoot them and kill them and drag them back across the border into Gaza, there is no more smiling. There is only obliteration. That might be tough. Some of us, some of our fellow citizens who go to Cornell and Yale and Harvard might think that that's wrong. But this is the nature of security and peace. There can be no peace through appeasement. There can be no peace through appeasement. There is only peace through strength. It's a restrained strength. It's something that's not just wielded for any old reason. But when your friends are attacked and they've been with you through thick and thin, you have a responsibility to stand by them and support them. And we have a responsibility to stand by and support Israel with everything that they must do. We have a president right now. Listen, he earns it, actually. He does earn the booze. But you have a president right now who has left our southern border wide open. He's done it on purpose. And if you're going to be really honest, he doesn't even know why he did it. Somebody told him to do so. He doesn't even have the respect for you, the American people, to go down to that southern border and investigate the disaster he created. I started affectionately, affectionately referring to Joe Biden as the master of disaster. Not Apollo Creed, not Apollo Creed, the real master of disaster. Because his southern border policy has led to an invasion of the United States of America. It has allowed our border agents to have no ability to control what's actually going on on our southern border. It has left us wide open. There was a report that came out yesterday of a 20-year-old Palestinian who acquired a gun and who was doing some trainings because he wanted to inflict harm on us here at home. How he got into our country? Oh, I don't know. Take a guess probably through the southern border. We have drug cartels who have operational control of said border. We have fentanyl killing 100,000 Americans a year through that southern border. And he doesn't even go. So in the halls of D.C., when they say it's time to fund the government, my position has been very clear. I'm not interested in funding a government that doesn't do its first job, which is securing the border of the United States of America. And I got a special message 
I have an extra special message for my colleagues in the Senate, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell. Boys, my mom is probably going to see this recording, so I will. Boys, FAFO. We cannot continue to fund a government that doesn't do its first job, which is securing the border and securing the people of the United States of America. And they might disagree in the Senate, but there's a reason why the Senate has been wrong on every issue facing the United States for 30 years. The time has come for new leadership in Washington. The time has come for the people of this country to speak through their representatives to actually get the job done, to actually get the business done, and not say, oh, we got to wait for another election, oh, we're only one half of one third of the federal government. We ain't got time for that no more. Don't believe me? Ask Eric Adams, the mayor of New York. Don't bone too much. We'll do that next election cycle. But right now, they're talking to Joe Biden in the White House. And very quietly, they're saying, you know, you got to fix this southern border thing. This thing's a problem for us. They're taking kids off of soccer fields in New York to build shelters for migrants. They're bringing in translators into classrooms so young black kids and young white kids and young Hispanic kids who were already locked out of the classroom for two years in New York City are only going to fall further behind. Back to Mitch and the Senate Republicans. If you don't see that now is the time to squeeze this president and secure the border, I don't think you'll ever see it. I see it. I see it because it's not just Republicans who want to secure a country. You now have Democrats who want to secure a country. You have independent voters who want to secure a country. And they know full well that Joe Biden's terrible policy has led to a decrease in American security, and it's hitting everybody in their states, not just the people who live on the border in Texas. It's hitting us all. So now's the time to act. And now's the time to hold the line to make sure that our southern border is secure. While I'm on the discussion of Joe Biden, let's talk about a couple of things with him. I've never seen anybody get a check from their brother for $200,000. You know, I mean, look, I love my brothers. I do. They've not given me a check for $10. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen an administration that knowingly spied on the American people and suppressed the voices of the American people. I've not seen an administration that has allowed the Department of Justice to cover up for their son, blatantly cover up, to the point that we have 40 FBI agents who have all come and have told us on the, on the Oversight Committee that they were blocked in their investigations. They've told us this. We have a federal prosecutor in Pennsylvania who said that the normal investigative procedures were stopped by higher-ups at the FBI and at Maine Justice. So I know we always talk about, well, are you going to hold them accountable? What are you going to do about it, Byron? I'm telling you, we are very, very close, in my view, to having articles of impeachment on Joe Biden. And it ain't just about the money, y'all. It ain't just about the money. It's about the fact that this man has been derelict in his duty. He has ignored federal immigration law. 
And oh, by the way, the Attorney General of the United States, Mr. Merrick Garland, Look, I know I got on Mitch earlier, but if there's one thing we could thank Mitch for is that he held the line to make sure that Merrick Garland was never on the Supreme Court. We got to thank him for that one. He was right then. But for Merrick Garland, don't get too cozy because we're going to be investigating you as well. I'm not interested in being lectured by the radical left. They try to tell us that they fight for the soul of America and they fight for democracy. That is a lie. We are the ones who fight for the soul of America. We are the ones who are fighting for the republic here in America. We are the ones who are fighting for free speech in America. We are the ones who are fighting for people to be able to just run their businesses without knuckleheads in Washington telling you what to do with your business. We are the ones who fight for that in America. We are the ones who fight for young kids to have an opportunity as success, to have an opportunity to actually learn and not be indoctrinated here in America. We are the ones who fight for a military that has one job, and that is to go kill the enemy and come home and not indoctrinate them as well. And we fight for that here in America. I'm not going to be lectured to by the radical left. You should not be lectured to by the radical left because they are wrong and they have been wrong because their desire is not a constitutional republic of, by, and for the people. Their goal is for you to bend the knee to their wishes and their whims, and they are too stupid to understand that they don't know enough for our country to be successful. It requires you, America, to be successful, not people up on Capitol Hill. You know what the funny thing is? I didn't really know what I was going to talk about today. I really didn't know. I got into politics 13 years ago, 14 years ago. I don't know the years are going by fast now. But when I got into politics, I was an activist just like you. I knocked doors just like you. I made phone calls just like you. I got in my car and drove people to doors just like you. My passion for this country is because this is the only country where a kid like me had an opportunity to be successful. That's my passion. My sons are in the front row now. They were hanging out at the pool. What's up, fellas? Their lives are going to be massively better than anything my mother even thought was conceivable because of this country. And so as we turn the pages into 2024, we have a golden opportunity politically in America. I was um, on Maria Bartiromo's show last Sunday. Love Maria. Love her. She's great. And she asked me, she goes, Byron, do you think that black voters would vote for Donald Trump? And I said, yes. And she goes, and I, all I said was, you have a lot of people in our country. They're white. They're black. They're, his, they're Puerto Rican, they're Peruvian, they're Guatemalan, El Salvadoran. I just don't want to say Hispanic. That's not respectful. Don't call a Cuban a Dominican. You'll have a fight on your hands. Don't do that. Don't do that. When you go out and knock doors, be careful. Don't do that. But what they see in this country is a place where their kids have an opportunity to be significantly more than they ever thought possible. That's what they see when they see America. 
That's what we see when we see America. That's what a lot of black voters are seeing right now. They will tell you, man, this Joe Biden dude is a dummy. My, my, my pockets aren't right. My money's not looking good. Can you just bring Trump back? That's what they're saying. RPOF, that's what they're saying. So when I get people like Roland Martin who go to Twitter and say, oh, I'm lying on Maria Bartiromo, I giggle and I laugh because I know better. What I know is, is that the radical left thinks that everybody's just going to fall in line. But Joe Biden has been so bad as the 46th president of the United States that a lot of voters who aren't really Republican voters are going to vote to make Donald Trump the 47th president of the United States. Now, the last thing I'm going to say is this, and I'm going to leave the stage, because I love y'all. I could do this for another hour, but I'm not going to do that. Man, I love you too, man. All right, appreciate you. We're in the middle of our primary process. We understand that. A lot of candidates have been up here today. This business of ours as a party, as a family, is going to be done probably over the next five to six months. Everybody's going to support who they want to, and I respect that might disagree, but I respect it. But when our business is done, when we go to Milwaukee and we hand over the nomination of our party, we have one job at that point, and that is to take back the White House, that is to take back the Senate, that is to increase our majorities in the House, and that is to go save the United States of America. God bless you, RPOF. God bless the United States of America. Do you have the votes to expel Santos today? Well, we're certainly going to find out. I, I think, um, obviously, a lot of our members are taking this very seriously, as they should. No one was sent here to expel someone. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, members like uh, George Santos historically have resigned. They've, they've gone to defend themselves. Instead, uh, my colleague is divorced from reality and uh, continues uh, to uh, engage in behavior that, quite frankly, has obviously broken the law, uh, uh, defrauded taxpayers, voters, and, uh, uh, and donors. I'm hopeful uh, that we have the votes and can send the message that there's a standard of conduct we intend to uphold. You talk to everyone. You will usually have a good sense of the conference. Have, have the vibes been that, you know, people are feeling like it's time that he goes? Have, if we've heard mix. I, uh, no, I think most members yeah. would like to move on from this sad yeah. chapter. Uh, but I, they're taking very seriously this question of expulsion. I, I don't judge my colleagues for the ultimate decision they make. I'm just hopeful that they allow the voters and the residents of the, this district in New York uh, to, uh, to be given the opportunity to elect somebody that they believe will re represent them well. Do you think it's a problem for some uh, from in swing districts and things? Uh, you know, even if they vote to expel because of the toxicity mm -hmm. of Mr. Santos and they fail to do so and they say this is just one more you know, thing, the Republicans they can't, they're dealing with a speaker, they went through that for a month, they can't pass a bill. They can't do anything. They yeah. can't even kick out Santos. And doesn't that wash up on your shoes? The, uh, well, listen, I'm, I'm I'm very clear. I've called for his resignation. Uh, I think, uh, frankly, uh, he sh shouldn't be here now. I've uh, voted now, or will have voted three times, I think, uh, to, uh, uh, to expel him. The question of expelling a member is a very high threshold. I believe that his behavior has far exceeded uh, the, uh, that, that threshold, and therefore uh, is deserving of, of being removed from, from the House. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a tough question that people have to answer for themselves and, uh, by the way, uh, be judged uh, and, by their constituents. And are members really that concerned about precedent here as well? I mean, or is that just a fig leaf to say, oh, you know, we don't want to cut down our majority or we don't want to, you know, throw out somebody, you know, and, and go down this road? Is that just a fig leaf? No, I think every member is coming to this somewhat differently. The con concept of, uh, well, this establishes a new precedent is a real uh, 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 factor in some of the decision making, but I'll, I'll be very clear, I said this yesterday, we weren't elected to defend precedent. We were elected to defend the Constitution, and the Constitution provides uh, through a due process, which George Santos was provided, the opportunity for the House, through its rules, to enforce its ethics code and to expel a member. I believe that it's time for that to happen. Thank you so much. Impeachment. What are you hoping to learn today? Well, I, I've said this. I, I didn't come to Congress to expel a member 
prefer to impeach a president. Uh, I came to Congress to judge facts and make decisions on behalf of the people I represent. They want me to be deliberate in that. I don't serve on the committees of jurisdiction. I believe there is impropri impropriety and, and incidents of corruption. I believe that the facts should lead us to, uh, to the next step. If those facts, as presented today and over the course of the next several days, require additional um, House oversight through an inquiry, I could envision supporting that. I just want to be sure that we are very deliberate uh, in improving and showing to the American people that the facts are leading us to the point uh, where that particular level of oversight is, is absolutely necessary. So it sounded like Chairman Comer would have a vote on the House floor in maybe three, a few weeks. Yeah. Um, is that something you could support? You need to. You aren't there yet. You well, I don't. I don't sort of judge it that way. I, yeah. There. Oh, I'm sorry. There are issues of impropriety without yeah. question. Uh, the administration has been less than forthcoming, uh, and frankly, we have an obligation to provide oversight. I believe that we are headed in the direction uh, of certainly having a vote come before us. I believe the facts could very well lead lead me to that conclusion. But I certainly want to, to the chairman and the members of the and, and the committees themselves to provide that information to us. Do you think this should be a big focus of the conference? At the I think it. I, uh, um, <laughs> When there is corruption uh, and, and, and impropriety in the executive branch, it is the constitutional responsibility of the House to provide that oversight. We don't get to decide when that happens or to dismiss it when it does happen. And so we are confronting what are issues of impropriety and corruption. That has to be confronted, and that is the constitutional responsibility of the House of Representatives. Thank you so much, you Congressman. Thanks, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. These are, um, these are serious times and this is a very serious matter. And I've, I've said many times over the last few years, because impeachment has been an issue that we've all become all too familiar with, that next to the declaration of war, you can make an argument that impeachment may be the heaviest power that Congress holds. Th that, that constitutional responsibility lies with the House. We, we have a duty to pursue the facts where they lead. John Adams famously said, facts are stubborn things, and you heard a recitation of that here this morning. These facts are alarming. They're alarming to the American people, they're alarming to us. And so while we take no pleasure in, uh, in the proceedings here, we have a responsibility to do it. We're very proud of the work of these three chairmen that you've seen here, Chairman Comer and Jordan and Smith. They've done an exceptional job in uncovering the obvious corruption. And you've heard it here summarized this morning very succinctly. President Biden and the Biden family. We, we owe it to the American people to continue this process, but to do it methodically and transparently. Many of you know I was on, uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm a constitutional law attorney. I served on President Trump's impeachment defense team twice. And we lamented openly and we decried how the Democrats politicized that process. They were brazenly political and how they, they brought those uh, meritless impeachment charges against the, the president. This, what you're seeing here, is exactly the opposite. We are the rule of law team. The Republican Party stands for the rule of law. And the people in charge of this are doing this thoroughly, carefully, methodically. They're investigating and gathering all the facts. And to do this appropriately and to do it in a manner that upholds our constitutional responsibility requires time. It, it requires a sound process. You don't rush something like this. You can't if you're going to have fidelity to the Constitution. These chairmen are committed to proceeding in that manner. And that's what you're seeing. We, we've heard from whistleblowers, Biden business associates, legal experts, and now we have reached the point in the investigation that we need to hear from a handful of really key witnesses in this. The, the chairman have issued a, a few dozen subpoenas, and we expect that those are to be complied with in an expeditious manner. We're not prejudging this. We will follow the facts wherever they lead. Again, that's our constitutional duty. <coughs> And, and I fully support our chairman and their efforts, and we'll have a lot more to share on this in the days ahead. We'll take a few questions. Monday. Uh, there's also going to be. Hi, chairman. Can you give us another update? Hmm? What was what was the um, what was how did thing, how were seen, things seen, were I don't think we could have been better received under any scenario. Uh, the conference is uh, eager to proceed with this. Uh, they recognize the obstruction. The White House has continued to. Uh, Put forward in our investigation. They want this investigation to continue. They were home for for a week, and the people in their district say we want answers to these questions. You went in and said maybe a vote on the floor in a few weeks, but now we expect it tomorrow, uh, next week. Is that true? I, I, that's up to leadership. And what's the what's the pitch that you made in their members? Some who might be on. The I didn't make a pitch. I said these are the facts. This is the evidence. We have the website up. Why do you think formalizing the inquiry is necessary at this point? Well, one of the letters from the from Abby Lowell implied this wasn't a legitimate 
impeachment inquiry because you hadn't had a vote on it. And you're confident that you have the votes for it to pass? Well, I, I'm confident our conference will want to uh, get the truth for the American people. Are you going to be whipping people, or is there going to be any kind uh, of that's, operation? That's the whip's job. <laughs> Hi, Congressman Curtis. How you doing? Hi. You going to vote to expel Santos today? Yes. Yes. Why do you think he deserves to be expelled? Well, I'm going to record it for my comms guy too. So you're so good. Well, he's pretty. Is tough. this Cody? No, no, who's it's Adam. Who's your chief? Uh, Corey Norman. Corey. We yes. love Corey. He's the best. Yeah. All right. Yes. You'll vote to expel Santos. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. So, I will. And then, what about impeachment inquiry? Um, they're giving a report, uh, an update on that. Is that something you can support yeah. at this juncture? You know, I, I'm, I'm anxious to hear more information. Um, there's obviously a difference between an inquiry, right, and impeachment, and so that influences me. But my bar for impeachment is incredibly high. What would you need to hear from them inside today? Um, that um, they need the inquiry uh, to either prove or disprove uh, what they're talking about. And for me, it's all about: is there an impeachable offense, and is there evidence of an impeachable offense? Have you seen anything that that comes anywhere close to that bar? So no, but thus perhaps why we need the inquiry because there certainly are some things that are troubling, mm -hmm. and I do think the American people would like to to have those resolved. So if there's a House floor vote. Comer said maybe in the next few weeks to formally authorize the inquiry. You support that? Well, I'm anxious Got to it. see what I learned this morning, so it's a little premature, but I'm. Um, it's possible. Yeah. Do you think the investigations are going in the right direction to proving anything? You know, um, I'm quite out of that loop um, for a member of Congress. What I mean by that is I'm not in those committees and things like that. So I, I'm anxious to learn more and, and see myself to see if I, if I feel that way. And then finally, um, Speaker Johnson's only been on the job yeah. a few weeks. How do you think he's doing so far? Have you had any meetings with him? Have you had um, outreach? I haven't. I, I'm looking forward to it. I'm letting him get his feet underneath him, obviously. But I, I think I'm um, very impressed uh, with what he's doing. He has some Rockets members of the caucus that he has to wrangle. Do you think he's doing an okay job? Um, from my perspective, he's doing a great job. Yeah. Thank you, Congressman yeah. Trader. Good morning. Today, the Ways and Means Committee will hear testimony by two credible IRS whistleblowers who at great personal and professional risk have exposed a coordinated effort among the DOJ, Hunter Biden's attorneys, and others to stop the tax investigation of Hunter Biden from following any leads to his father, Joe Biden. While hearing directly from IRS agents Shapley and Ziegler, we will also examine new documents they have provided that are protected under Section 6103 of the Tax Code. I will be asking the committee to make the proceedings of both our hearing today and those documents available to the public at the conclusion. While I cannot get into the specific details about these new documents, it's important to keep in mind what you already know. Based on evidence released in this impeachment inquiry so far, number one, President Biden lied. Despite what he claimed, not only has evidence shown he was aware of his office being sold around the world to the benefit of his family, but following the trail of money, it now appears he was both directly involved and directly benefited from his son's business dealings. Number two, Chairman Comer has revealed that President Biden himself, using fake names, attempted to hide his communications from public scrutiny. Number three, the Bidens moved an unimaginable sum of money amongst family members and, pre and papered it as loans from the International Bank of Joe Biden. The president's loans to family members raise serious red flags and should have resulted in reported interest income. Number four, Kevin Morris, acting as a special benefactor to the Biden family, paid at least two million in Hunter Biden's tax debts during a key time in 2020 when they would have been a huge political liability for the Biden campaign. These are facts, not opinions. Today, we will consider additional new evidence. And before I hand it off to Chairman Comer, 
I want to address a key claim Democrats have made that is completely false. Democrats have described the now over a thousand pages of released documents and witness testimony as quoted cherry picked. Despite participating in all, in all transcribed interviews, Democrats have since misrepresented witness testimony that confirms the allegations made by our whistleblowers and they have failed to provide any contradictory documents. It's one thing to say it, it's another thing to back it up. We have backed up every claim we have made. I now pass it to Chairman Comer. Thank you, Chairman Smith. The two brave IRS whistleblowers came forward to blow the whistle about misconduct in the Hunter Biden criminal investigation. They testified how investigators were prevented from following evidence that could have led to Joe Biden. Justice Department officials didn't want to talk about dad or the big guy. Why is that? Because the evidence leads to Joe Biden. This week we revealed how Hunter Biden's corporate entity, Owasco PC, made direct monthly payments to Joe Biden. Owasco PC is under investigation by the Justice Department for tax evasion and other serious crimes. Chinese and other foreign entities funneled millions of dollars into Hunter's Owasco PC. And some of this money landed in Joe Biden's bank account. These direct monthly payments to Joe Biden are part of a pattern revealing Joe Biden knew about, participated in, and benefited from his family's shady business schemes. Joe Biden lied when he told Americans he never spoke to his family about their business dealings. In fact, Joe Biden spoke dined, took meetings, and had coffee with his son's foreign business associates. Joe Biden lied when he said his family didn't make money in China. Evidence shows the Bidens received millions from Chinese nationals and entities. We've even traced how laundered China money landed in Joe Biden's bank account. Our investigation continues to produce evidence revealing President Biden's corruption and litany of lies. We will continue to follow the facts and provide transparency and accountability that are owed to the American people. I turn it over to Chairman Jordan. Uh, let me thank Chairman uh, Smith and Chairman Coleman for their great work. Uh, I would just say this, the White House is, I think this is the bottom line, frankly, the White House's story has changed multiple times. The Justice Department's story has changed multiple times. But the story and the testimony from Mr. Ziegler and Mr. Shapley has not changed, has not wavered, and it has stood up, stood up under several hours of cross-examination in the Oversight Committee when we had a hearing. Their testimony has been validated by every single witness we've talked to. We've now talked to three U.S. attorneys, two FBI agents, and other people in the Justice Department as part of our work and the depositions and interviews we've done. No one has refuted what Mr. Shapley and Mr. Ziegler have said. We issued a report this morning, just came out talking about this, that their testimony has stood up, and their testimony has stood up, you know why? because they're the ones telling the truth. And today they're going to release more information in the Ways and Means Committee. And we appreciate the work that Chairman, uh, Chairman Smith and his committee have done on this. And I'll turn it back over to the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. Well, look, the impeachment inquiry is necessary because, um, as you know, our, our committees of jurisdiction, oversight, judiciary, ways and means, Chairman uh, Comer and Jordan and Smith have done an extraordinary job following the facts on this. Remember, remember, it's the, Article One of the Constitution gives the House the impeachment authority, and I've said at this podium before, next to a declaration of war, impeachment, arguably the heaviest power that the, the House has. Why? Because it's so serious, it's so important. In the previous couple of years, uh, the House Democrats cheapened impeachment. They, they used it for partisan political purposes. They went after Donald Trump twice. I served on the impeachment defense team twice. We called those sham impeachments, snap impeachments. They were. What you're seeing right now is exactly the opposite of that. You're seeing a very deliberate investigation following, uncovering and following the facts, following the truth where it leads. That's what the Constitution requires the House to do. And the House Republicans have done that very methodically. So we have come to this sort of inflection point. Because, Chad, right now the White House is, um, is, is 
putting, is stonewalling that investigation. They're refusing to turn over key witnesses to allow them to testify as they've been subpoenaed. They're re refusing to turn over thousands of documents for the National Archives. And the House has no choice if it's going to follow its constitutional responsibility to formally adopt an impeachment inquiry on the floor so that when the subpoenas are challenged in court, we'll be at the apex of our constitutional authority. It will be a movement of, of a, a vote of the full House, and that will allow us to continue and, and continue on pace. This vote is not a vote to impeach President Biden. This is a vote to continue the inquiry of impeachment, and that's a necessary constitutional step, and I believe we'll get every vote that we can. I, no, all the moderates in our conference understand this is not a political decision. This is a legal decision. It's a constitutional decision. And whether someone is for or against impeachment is, is of no import right now. We have to continue our legal responsibility, and that is only, solely, what this vote is about. Okay. The gentleman yields. I now recognize uh, my colleague from Tennessee, Mr. Ogles, for five minutes of testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. people have witnessed record-breaking numbers of illegal alien apprehensions across the southern border, increased instances of human trafficking and sexual assault, and the continued unfettered flow of opioids, including fentanyl, into our communities. Very few, if any, individuals working in the Biden administration have faced any meaningful sanction or punishment for their role in undermining the sovereignty of America. There were 341,000 apprehensions at the U.S. land borders in September, setting an all-time record, Mr. Chairman. 309,000 apprehensions were calculated in October, marking the second highest total, between 16.8 million and 29 million illegals currently reside in the United States today and more foreign nationals are incentivized to similarly break our laws. Non-public data from the Department of Homeland Security indicates that the department has released at least 2.15 million illegal aliens into the United States between, between January 2021 through March 2023. Over 99% of these illegal aliens, 99.7, have effectively been protected against removal. While this administration continues to subsidize lawbreakers, our fellow citizens are forced to bear the consequences. This administration's indifference to the very real suffering of the American people has continued and compounding effects. My constituents inform me daily of the impact of Joe Biden's open border agenda on their families and communities. An estimated 162,000 illegal aliens now live in my home state of Tennessee, as do their 56,000 U.S.-born children. Illegal aliens add about 50,000 students to local schools and cost taxpaying citizens of my state an average of $4,456 per illegal alien. Education costs stand at approximately $571 million. Costs related to police, legal, and corrections concerns absorbed to an added $175.6 million. In total, in total, illegal aliens cost volunteer state taxpayers, my home state, our home state, $97.3 million, almost a billion dollars in 2023, Mr. Chairman. This is to say nothing of the heart-wrenching human cost of these policies. Overdose deaths in Tennessee have increased by 200% over the last five years, driven in part by nearly doubling of fentanyl seizures at the southern border from FY22 to FY2023. 14,100 pounds to be specific versus 26,700 pounds, sir. In my own district, authorities were finally able to apprehend an illegal alien male charged with drugging and raping 10 boys from the ages of 9 to 17 earlier this year. Like my colleague from Knoxville, Tim Burchett, I also was county executive. I saw firsthand the crimes committed by illegals. 
I attended the deaths of children who overdosed because of fentanyl from our southern border. This has to stop. Even while Tennesseans are asked to carry out the financial and human cost of illegal immigration, the Biden administration continues to leave no stone unturned in undermining my state's ability to respond to the crisis. Just last week, the Department of Justice imposed a $700,000 fine on trucking companies in Chattanooga for thoroughly vetting non-citizens and ensuring that any non-citizens were in the United States illegally. Mr. Chairman, we have a, a company in our home state trying to follow the law, and they were punished. Mr. Chairman, I would encourage the committee to take up the impeachment of President Joe Biden, to have the hearings, to get the facts, to hear the testimony, and to find out if this president compromised our country, if this president compromised the safety and the well-being of our citizens, and to find out if this president is guilty and should be impeached. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your time. It's an honor to be here, and I yield back. The, the gentleman yields, and we now have members here. Do you have any questions, Mr. Higgins? I have a comment, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Certainly. I thank the gentleman for appearing before us today. And regarding your final uh, questions about our inaugurated president, I would say the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Yes, sir. I concur. Claudia Tenney, thank New you. York. Thank you so much. Thank you, Troy. Uh, Congressman Nels. Andy Biggs, appreciate it. Uh, Congressman Fallon, all my colleagues for being here and highlighting this important issue. And, and I have to say, I have to echo the sentiments that it isn't just uh, Secretary Mayorkas. It is also Joe Biden who ultimately bears the responsibility. They've had over two years to secure our border, and we're seeing this flow of illegal immigrants. 4.5 million, only 72,000 have been deported. That's less than 2% of people claiming to be coming across this border. They've actually made it worse. And uh, I'm from New York State, which is not, which is a border state. Upstate New York is also uh, bordering with Canada, and uh, that's a whole issue we're going to talk about on another day. But I support this resolution and demanding the resignation and now the impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas. If he won't leave, we're going to have to impeach him. And a clear dereliction of duty. I also support the impeachment of Joe Biden. Um, his policies, all their policies, have created this humanitarian and national security disaster. Uh, as, as you've heard uh, detailed by my colleagues. But let me tell you a little bit about the small rural counties in upstate New York. We're the ones that had those night flights into Westchester County a couple of years ago that were highlighted by some officials that were secret. Uh, I led a letter with uh, my colleague Elise Stefanik and our leadership team and other members of the New York delegation. I'm getting full transparency from President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas on who are these people that are illegal immigrants that are coming to the state of New York just recently, we had uh, a discovery that there were 35 Colombian illegal immigrants in the small hamlet of Jamestown, a population of 28,000 people. We don't know where they came from. We don't know anything about them. We don't know who's paying for it. But guess who is paying for it from, in the end because the uh, Biden administration is not being transparent about it? Our local taxpayers. And in New York, we face the highest tax burden of any state in the nation. Our local taxpayers still pay one half of the Medicaid share that no other state imposes on their local communities as New York State does. So that translates into some of the highest property taxes in the state of New York. And a lot of you think, hey, Westchester, Long Island, guess what? Upstate New York pays the highest per thousand rates on property taxes because of our low property values and our very high taxes. And that's because these burdens have been imposed on our taxpayers who have the least ability to pay. Uh, last year, it's worthy of note, a Yemeni terrorist was apprehended at the southern border wearing a jacket representing an upstate New York ambulance service, something we think he must have gotten online. Uh, an Iranian uh, citizen was detained yesterday who was on the terror watch list. Thankfully, there's one that we, they were able to, obtain, to get. I mean, this is, this is happening uh, every single day. Uh, and as I discussed these, these migrants in western New York and Jamestown, I heard from the county executive this morning about who these people are, and uh, he didn't even know, wasn't informed. Why isn't the Biden administration letting our local governments know who's there and, and why they're there? 
Um, every state in this country has become a border state as we know. We're hearing about these flights everywhere. I visited the border as well. And when I went to the airport in El Paso, it was filled with people who were dressed in the clothes of illegal, that illegal immigrants are issued at the border. I feel terrible as a mother uh, of a son and, and, a, and a mom thinking about the human trafficking and the dangers to our children that have been described, not to mention the fentanyl overdoses that are overwhelming, overwhelming our communities. And it's the principal duty of our federal government to provide our national security. Uh, the reason New York didn't sign on to the Constitution until the, uh, the very last hour in the 1700s was because of our desire to have sovereignty and to make sure that our federal government protected our national security and our national defense. That is not happening under President Biden or under this secretary, which is why I join with my colleagues in calling for the, uh, calling for the impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas. Let's hope he resigns today as a result of this press conference. If not, let's go forward with impeachment proceedings to make sure that we do something to protect our southern border, which is causing us great harm, uh, not just uh, to the security of our nation, but also to our taxpayers, and particularly those in upstate New York. Uh, it's a privilege to join with my colleagues, strong, courageous leaders who stand up for our country. And uh, I think I next, I believe, is uh, Nancy Eli. Mace, or Eli. Now, uh, Eli Crane, uh, happy to introduce Good morning. A point of personal privilege. There is a reason why the testimony at the Education and Workforce Committee garnered one billion views worldwide. And it's because those university presidents made history by putting the most morally bankrupt testimony into the congressional record, and the world saw it. As a Harvard graduate, I'm reminded of Harvard's motto, Veritas, which goes back and it's older than the founding of our country. It goes back to the 1640s. In addition, the motto was Veritas Christo et Ecclesiae, truth for Christ and the church. Larry Summers, who was president of Harvard when I was an undergrad, talked about the meaning of Veritas is divine truth, moral truth. Let me be clear, Veritas does not depend on the context. This is a moral failure of Harvard's leadership and higher education leadership at the highest levels. And the only change they have made to their code of conduct, where they failed to condemn calls for genocide of the Jewish people, the only update to the code of conduct is to allow a plagiarist as the president of Harvard. Shifting gears to what is on the floor this week. I wanted to highlight the National Defense Authorization Act. I'm a proud member of the House Armed Services Committee. Our speaker and our House Republican Conference and our committee members have done tremendous work. Wanted to highlight the Parents' Bill of Rights provision, uh, which I know the speaker spot ver fought very hard for, that we're very proud to have in the bill. That was a provision that I authored and garnered bipartisan support in the House. Uh, but unfortunately, Democrats fought hard to keep that out. Our speaker got that provision in. And I also wanted to highlight uh, Chairwoman Kathy McMorris Rogers' tremendous work on her health care package, standing up for patients to lower costs and bring more transparency in the health care space, specifically highlighting the community health centers provision, which we worked so hard in my office with the com committee members to get included. So with that, I want to turn it over to Erin Houchin, who has been such a strong advocate on the health care provisions. Erin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Chair Elise, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak on uh, the Lower Cost, More Transparency Act. Um, the rising cost of prescription drugs is among the issues I hear about most from my constituents. Because of this, I was proud to lead Republican efforts on the Hidden Fees Disclosure Act. And I'm glad to see it's included in the Lower Cost, More Transparency Act. I thank Chairwoman Rogers for including it that just passed the House last night. It's bipartisan legislation that is the first step toward driving down the cost of health care. And this bill is not just Washington smoke and mirrors. It contains actual reforms that will bring better health care and lower costs for families. It will lower the cost of prescription drugs for Americans through transparency. It will require transparency and accountability from pharmacy benefit managers who have failed to follow the law. It will allow small business owners to compete in the healthcare market. 
We can't drive down the cost of health care without full transparency. Until that is achieved, we are going to keep contending on behalf of patients. I look forward to continuing our work together uh, on health care affordability, and I yield now to Chairwoman Kathy Morris Rogers. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Congresswoman Houchin. Last night, we took a major step, a historic step, to drive down the cost of health care with price transparency. It's an issue that over 90% of Americans support. We're empowering patients and employers to shop for health care and to have ac access to the accurate information about the cost of care, the treatment, and the services. You know, I think about a person who saw her out-of-pocket costs skyrocket from $30 to $350 simply because her doctor's office was purchased by a hospital system. Or the woman who was hit with a bill totaling $11,000 more than what she was originally quoted. Our bill will help patients like them. And it's a major bipartisan health care victory for the American people. I urge the Senate to help send this bill to the president's desk because it's going to make a meaningful difference in people's lives. So thank you, everyone. And I get to introduce our whip, Tom Emmer. This week, House Republicans are going to bring a resolution to the floor to formalize our impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden. Put simply, this vote will allow the House Judiciary, Oversight, and Ways and Means Committees to continue their investigations. The evidence mounting against the president cannot be ignored. We know Joe Biden has lied or, to or misled the American people about his knowledge of his son's business dealings over and over again. And it is very likely that he was involved in and benefited from his family's corrupt business dealings as well. So the House has an obligation to continue gathering evidence and ensure the American people get the transparency and the accountability they deserve. Yet the Biden administration has been stonewalling our investigations. The Department of Justice has refused to allow two attorneys to testify before the Judiciary Committee. The White House sent Chairman Comer and Jordan a letter stating they have no intention of complying with our subpoenas and requests for interviews without a formal vote. And the National Archives has withheld thousands of pages of documents and emails. It's clear the House will have to defend our lawful investigations in court. And passing this resolution will put us in the best position possible to enforce our subpoenas and set forth a clear process. As we have said numerous times before, voting in favor of an impeachment inquiry does not equal impeachment. We will continue to follow the facts wherever they lead. And if they uncover evidence of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, then and only then will the next steps towards impeachment proceedings be considered. No one in this country is above the law, and that includes President Joe Biden. Uh, now it's my privilege to turn it over to our leader, Mr. Scalise. Well, thank you, Whip. Uh, we will be wrapping up a very busy year at the end of this week. We have a number of important votes. The Whip just talked about the impeachment inquiry vote that will happen tomorrow. Uh, the NDAA uh, will be voted on Thursday. Uh, but if you think about where we started this year, it's been an up and down year. I know for those of you in the press, there's never been a week where it was boring for you. It's been a lot to cover. But uh, we started the year confronting D.C. crime. If you go back to the beginning of the year, we brought bills to the floor to start addressing the things that we laid out when Republicans ran to get the majority in our commitment to America. We told the country what we would do. We laid out an agenda, and we immediately started to bring those bills to the floor. And if you think about one of those first bills that we brought to the floor to address crime in D.C., Joe Biden actually issued a veto threat on the bill that we brought to the floor right before he signed the bill into law, because he realized that not only had we built momentum behind it, but the public was fed up with crime. Uh, we continued to stand up for those problems that have been created by the Biden administration. We put together H.R. 1, a great strong energy package. His families were paying more at the pump, 50 percent more when they go to fill up their cars for gasoline because Joe Biden had shut off the spigots in America while going to foreign countries and begging dictators to produce energy in their countries, making it harder for us to produce American energy, which, by the way, is the cleanest 
energy in the world. If you want to lower carbon emissions, make your energy here in America. Don't fly Air Force One to Saudi Arabia or give breaks to Venezuela or Russia or Iran. And so what we did is passed a bill to make it easier to produce energy in America to lower costs for families. We passed that bill over to the Senate. They refused to even take it up because Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden want families to pay more at the pump. We came together and recognized for years that there is a crisis at the border. The day Joe Biden took office, he opened up America's border, sent the message all around the world, not just to South and Central America. And we've seen millions of people coming into our country illegally, including people on the terrorist watch list, people from over 150 different countries. And it's gotten worse. The crisis continues to escalate. So House Republicans came together and said, let's fix this problem. We invited Democrats to join with us to address this problem as well, as Democrat mayors all around the country were ringing the same alarm bells telling the president to fix this problem that he continues to ignore. And so we passed H.R. 2. Months ago sent that over to the Senate. And the president refuses to engage in any negotiations on fixing the border crisis. The Senate, led by Chuck Schumer, refused to even engage in this problem. And they thought that they could just continue to ignore the problem while asking for funds for other countries. And so when you saw Speaker Mike Johnson come into the speakership, he made it very clear. As we talk about Ukraine and other issues, we have to secure America's border first. And he laid that marker out very, very early. And Joe Biden's continued to ignore that. But more and more now, people all across the country recognize this is a crisis. Democrat mayors, again, continue to say it's a crisis. But Joe Biden will continue to refuse this problem. We're not going to let this go away. So we passed a strong border security bill. We passed a parent's bill of rights. We've had oversight hearings and committees, not just exposing the corruption that you're seeing within the Biden family. You talked about the hearing that we had last week that the House Education Committee had in Virginia Fox's committee, where Elise asked a basic question. And it was a question about whether or not genocide of Jews is OK with the code of student conduct, a very simple question that every college president should have been able to answer. And yet you saw the moral bankruptcy and the failure of those college presidents to answer that basic question. Uh, got over a billion impressions globally. And I think alarmed and shocked people all across the world, not just here in America. Uh, we've exposed anti-Semitism and called it out for what it is. And we will continue to do that as well. We're going to continue to bring legislation to address the problems that are hurting families all across this nation. Uh, but this has been a busy agenda for this House this year. Next year is going to be just as busy, regardless of what the size of the majority is. And so while I know there's talk about how hard it's been or how small the majority might be, when you think about all the bills that we've passed over to the Senate to address the problems that struggling families are facing, the Senate at some point is going to have to start taking up those bills and start taking some action. Joe Biden should start looking at those bills and realize the damage that Bidenomics is doing to families and the cost that it's having on them and that there is a better way to address these problems and House Republicans will continue to lead and leading that effort is our speaker, Mike Johnson. Happy to bring him up. Thank you, Mr. Leader. I appreciate that uh, year in review. There, there is a lot to uh, discuss and to uh, remember. It seems like this year was multiple years, doesn't it? A lot going on. Look, democracy is messy sometimes, but we work in the greatest deliberative body in the world, in the history of the world, the United States Congress. And the House Republican majority is moving the ball forward to continue to lead. I do want to talk about just very briefly this, uh, this health care uh, bill, because this is a big thing. Um, I'm really grateful to Chairwoman Kathy McMorris Rogers and Energy and Commerce uh, the committee, her committee, for their leadership on this important issue. On, on top of spending $15,000 more annually just to afford basic goods, American families we all know right now are struggling, and they have to contend now, of course, with uh, needlessly opaque, inefficient, and an unaffordable health care system. We have to do something about that. So the, the Lower Cost, More Transparency Act that we'll pass uh, is our House Republicans making good on our efforts to bring down the cost of health care and empower American people to make their own health care decisions and not have the government and bureaucrats in the way. The, the bill is a broad, bipartisan, supported piece of legislation. It arms patients with accurate and transparent information about the cost and care of prescription drugs. That's a big deal, as you've heard discussed here. 
It supports community health care centers and preserves Medicaid for hospitals that serve rural communities. Uh, many of them I, I represent in my district in Louisiana. And this is a critical and, and necessary assistance for rural health care providers. Make no mistake about that. And also, this bill is, is going to expand access to generics and lower cost uh, or, or lower out of pocket costs for our seniors. And they desperately need that relief, and we all know it. And here's the kicker. As was noted, the entire package is fully offset. And so it actually reduces the deficit by more than $700 million. What a concept. House Republicans are committed to making health care more affordable and prices more transparent, and we are committed to doing so in a manner that is fiscally responsible and improves care for our constituents. So we'll be happy to pass that uh, off the House floor. I know you probably have a few questions. We'll take a few. We'll go. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Oh, you want. Go Good ahead. morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. I keep hearing from Republicans, you say, we're going to follow the facts where we lead on this impeachment investigation. But aren't there going to be a lot of conservatives in your party, because this has been drummed up for so long, we're going to do impeachment, we're looking at these tax records, we're looking at the Hunter Biden stuff here, that if you guys don't call an impeachment vote in the next few months, they're going to say, wait a minute, that's it. I mean, haven't you put them over the barrel a little bit if you, in fact, do not have a vote to impeach the President of the United States in a couple of months? Chad, we're following the Constitution, and I've made this very clear. Remember, my background is constitutional law. I served on impeachment defense team twice under President Trump. We developed, unfortunately, Elisa and I an expertise in this area. This is not something they really covered in law school. Uh, what you know about impeachment, if you look at the Constitution, is it's a heavy authority that's given to the House, specifically to the House. That's where the, the power lies. And next to the Declaration of War, you've all heard me say many times, I think it may be the heaviest power that we have. It's very, very serious business. It has to be conducted in that way. The impeachment inquiry is necessary now, as, our, as Whip Emmer just explained, because we've come to this impasse where following the facts where they lead is hitting a stone wall, because the White House is impeding that investigation now. They're not allowing witnesses to come forward and thousands of pages of documents. So we have no choice to fulfill our constitutional responsibility. We have to take the next step. We're not making a political decision. It's not. It's a legal decision. So people have feelings about it one way or the other. We can't prejudge the outcome. The Constitution does not permit us to do so. We have to follow the truth where it takes us, and that is exactly what we're going to do. And I'll note, too, I know that, that, that people are, um, you know, frustrated sometimes with the, the time that's being invested in this, but this is the way the founders anticipated that something like this would go. There's, there's no, there shouldn't be any such thing as a snap impeachment, a sham impeachment like the Democrats did against President Trump. This is the opposite of that. And that's why people are getting restless, because they want things to happen quickly. If you follow the Constitution and you do the right thing, you cannot rush it. You have to follow the facts. So, but you don't think there's an expectation by the base that, that you guys are, are going to, again, I know all these <laughs> predicates and caveats here. There's not an expectation that your side is going to impeach the Chad, president because, Chad, because that's what they were elected in the majority. For. People have a lot of opinions and a lot of expectations on all sides. What we are bound to do because of our oath to the Constitution is to follow it, and that's what we're going to do. Next question. And, yeah. and just to follow up on that, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. If you get into the spring and decide not to impeach the president based on the inquiry, you would be comfortable with that decision essentially absolving him months before a presidential election? We're, we're, not, we're not going to prejudge the outcome of this. We can't because, again, it's not a political calculation. We're following the law, and we, and we are the rule of law team, and I'm going to hold to that. That's my commitment. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, can you talk a bit about the negotiations around spending top lines? What are the biggest roadblocks around that, and are you concerned at all about you know, the upcoming deadline in a few weeks? Um, listen, we're, we're all hands on deck on the appropriations bills. As we know, we have looming deadlines, and, and we all agreed on that. But what we also agreed to was what's written in the law, and that's the FRA numbers on top line. Um, the Senate has, has been uh, projecting and writing well above that to, I don't know, billions of dollars. Um, that's not what the law says. And so I came in as the new speaker, and I said, again, as the rule of law team, we're going to follow the law. So that's where the negotiation stands. We're awaiting a volley from the other side, should there be one. But the House has done its job. We passed uh, seven of the 12 approach bills. That's almost 80 percent of federal funding. Eleven of the 12 have made it through the process, if not all the way to the floor. And so we're in a position where we could go to conference committee and negotiate this. Our appropriators want to do so. Our, our, our cardinals, as we call them, the chairman of the subcommittees and appropriations, are ready to do the work. But we're awaiting the other team, the other, the other side, the other chamber, to come forward with a, a number that we can agree upon that we write to. And that's the impasse, and that's what we're waiting on. But, but the, the law is the law. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Yeah, right front row. Um, on FISA, can you kind of delve into your thought 
process going through that? You changed your mind multiple times on exactly whether it be a short-term extension or not, and you changed your mind yesterday on Queen of the Hill situation. Can you just walk us through how that thought process happened? Uh, I, I didn't change my mind on FISA. See, FISA is a very uh, important piece of legislation, and Section 702, which would expire at the end of the year, is a really, really important provision because it protects us on the homeland. It protects uh, us from terrorist attacks. It's, it's the tool that we use uh, to to un uncover those uh, plots when they're being planned, and it's been very, very effective in that in that measure. And that's why you have uh, conservatives and and uh, liberals, progressives, who agree that it's a really important tool. What the, we all also agree on is that it must be dramatically reformed because it's been abused 287,000 times, I think, between 20 and 20, 2020 and 2021. The FBI did queries on American citizens in violation of that law and our basic civil liberties. So we have this very important matter to, uh, to determine and resolve, and you have lots of different opinions on, on where that is. We have two committees of jurisdiction, Judiciary and the Intelligence Committee, uh, who have worked up uh, different uh, measures, different bills. We've only had the text of those for four or five days, something like that, about a week. Uh, and here we are near the end of the deadline. Now, as soon as I became Speaker, we knew the deadline was coming, and I brought those committees together. Um, they were working from a working group, a task force that was put forward by three members of both committees that worked for about six months. Y'all may have seen, I think you have, they came up with about 45 reforms that would, uh, would resolve all of these issues. But of about four or five of those key reforms, there's a disagreement between the two uh, committees. Um, the, 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 we're working towards consensus, but this is a very, very serious matter. This isn't some minor policy in our law. This is about keeping Americans safe. And so we take the responsibility seriously. As recently as last night, uh, we, had, uh, we were in a room uh, with all the interested parties and, and, uh, and House Republicans there, and uh, there's still some disagreement about a couple of those key provisions. So I am not one who wants to rush this. I don't think we can make a mistake in this. I think we've got to do it right. And so we're going to allow the time to do that. So having a short-term extension on the NDAA allows us the time to work not only in our own chamber, but with the other chamber as well, to come forward with a, a compromise provision that will not only keep us safe, but will also safeguard our civil liberties. Both of those objectives must be achieved, and that's why it's taken a long time. Again, as I said at the outset, and I'll close with this, democracy is messy sometimes, but we have to get it right. We're the greatest delivery body in the world, and we're going to do our job and do it well. Sometimes it takes more time. Uh, than we would like, but it's worth it to get it right, especially on a product as important as Pfizer. So that's that's what we're going to do. Thank Steve, you all. Thank, thank you. What is your message to <laughs> This week, House Republicans are going to bring a resolution to the floor to formalize our impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden. Put simply, this vote will allow the House Judiciary, Oversight, and Ways and Means Committees to continue their investigations. The evidence mounting against the President cannot be ignored. We know Joe Biden has lied or, to or misled the American people about his knowledge of his son's business dealings over and over again. And it is very likely that he was involved in and benefited from his family's corrupt business dealings as well. So the House has an obligation to continue gathering evidence and ensure the American people get the transparency and the accountability they deserve. Yet the Biden administration has been stonewalling our investigations. The Department of Justice has refused to allow two attorneys to testify before the Judiciary Committee. The White House sent Chairman Comer and Jordan a letter stating they have no intention of complying with our subpoenas and requests for interviews without a formal vote. And the National Archives has withheld thousands of pages of documents and emails. It's clear the House will have to defend our lawful investigations in court. And passing this resolution will put us in the best position possible to enforce our subpoenas and set forth a clear process. As we have said numerous times before, voting in favor of an impeachment inquiry does not equal impeachment. We will continue to follow the facts wherever they lead. And if they uncover evidence of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, then and only then will the next steps towards impeachment proceedings be considered. No one in this country is above the law, and that includes President Joe Biden. Uh, now it's my privilege to turn it over to our leader, Mr. Scalise. Are there any uh, further amendments? 
Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. The gentleman uh, from Colorado is recognized. The clerk will report the resolution. Amendment number four to House Resolution 918, offered by Mr. Nagoose. Page two, line seven, strike investigative and insert the following. Open and transparent investigative. Page six, line one, strike investigative and insert the following. Open and transparent investigative. Page nine, line 19, strike investigative and insert the following. Open and transparent investigative. The gentleman's recognized on his amendment. I think the chairman hesitate to belabor the arguments I've made already regarding what I consider to be and what I think the American mm -hmm. people would find to be a baseless impeachment process that Republicans have initiated. <coughs> it's a political stunt. The American people know that to be the case. They know that because there's been no cogent articulation by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle as to what crime they're actually investigating, no <coughs> connection to the constitutional standard for impeachment. But one of the other reasons they know this to be true is because of the sham process that Republicans have initiated. And this amendment seeks to at least rectify that glaring defect. And while this amendment, of course, has an audience of the entire committee, it, it perhaps has an even more targeted audience of one or two of my friends on the other side of the aisle who have spoken in the past about transparency, and I'm hoping Maybe Mr. Massey or Mr. Roy might engage me in a colloquy about the merits of this particular amendment. It's very simple. Thus far, Republicans have engaged in a process that's been largely behind closed doors. Ms. Ledger Fernandez recounted this in great detail. The fact that so many of the interview transcripts have been hidden from the public, uh, the fact that witnesses who have sought to testify in public, including the president's son, uh, have uh, been impeded by the committee, from doing so. We went back and looked that the, the resolution that initiated the impeachment inquiry into former President Donald Trump is very similar in terms of the language that essentially Republicans have attempted to, to try to emulate different provisions of it. But there was one glaring omission, which is that in that resolution in 2019, prefaced behind every component paragraph that describes the investigation that the committees of jurisdiction would be engaged in was a commitment to, quote, open and transparent investigative proceedings. Three words, open and transparent. Those three words were deleted by Republicans in this resolution. And so this amendment is very simple. It's very straightforward. It's not a gotcha amendment. There's no hidden door. It's simply asking my colleagues to add that phrase, open and transparent, to the resolution as a prefatory clause before the description of each investigative committee of jurisdiction. Because thus far, the process has been anything but. And so I, it makes sense to me why Republicans didn't include the, include the phrase open and transparent, because the process has not been open and transparent. So I don't think this was a, an accident. It wasn't an you know, error by omission. It was intentional. There's a great way for the Republicans, my colleagues, my friends on the other side of the aisle, to perhaps prove the contrary, which is to support this amendment. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, would you, would I, you I, gentlemen I'm yield? happy to uh, yield to the gentleman from Kentucky. Words are words, but the problem is I served on the oversight committee when the Democrats did their inquiry. And that happened three floors underground in a skiff where nobody could bring their cell phones. I sat down there for hours. And what happened is the, there was no semblance of openness. Or you would be arrested and taken to jail if you tried to witness what, what was happening inside of that skiff for, for weeks. I sat down there with Ambassador Sondland. I sat down there with Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. There was no openness, no transparency, unless you count Adam Schiff running out every time he got a nugget of something that he could leak. And that is exactly how I witnessed that process. Was, was the gentleman on the Oversight Committee or the Intel Committee at the time? No, I was on Judiciary. So um, if, but I guess if you've been on either you, of those committees. You know, and I, I, 
I understand the argument you're making. I would say a couple things. First, the resolution, again, you all used it as the, you know, essentially took different provisions and modified them and so forth. The inquiry resolution was following that, those interviews, as I can best recollect, from back in October and September of 2019. The inquiry resolution that you all have essentially used as a template was after that. And essentially what the resolution then compelled, for example, HIPSI to do was to hold, required, shall hold public hearings and shall issue a report on its findings. Your resolution, and, and of course included that, that's why the open and transparent language was included. This resolution does the opposite. That's all I'm trying to figure out is why, why not say the oversight committee is going to have, quote, open and transparent proceedings. We're going to require them to hold a public hearing, and we're going to require them to issue a report. Why is it, why is the language permissive, and why is open and transparent been deleted? And I, it, it, this isn't a political argument. I'm, it's a good faith question. Which I answered with a question, why were we in a skiff for, yeah, for weeks? What I'm saying to you is these resolutions... When the Democrats yeah, uh, were uh, investigating. I hear you. What I'm saying to you is this inquiry resolution and the inquiry resolution that was adopted at the end of October in 2019 are both taking place after 10 months, 11 months of process. You've described the, what you, you know, contend are closed-door hearings that HIPSI conducted, interviews, excuse me, that they conducted. Obviously, you've heard us talk about closed-door interviews that oversight has conducted. My point is that at the impeachment inquiry phase, when we took that vote, from then on, everything was public, which is why the resolution was structured as such. In this instance, Republicans have removed it, and it's clear that they don't intend to have a public process. That's, that's what I'm asking. I, well, I suspect at some point the other side of the aisle will claim that uh, the information that's being publicly released has no business being in the public about bank records and things like that. So maybe it's an, it's an effort to respect the, the wishes of the other side. Uh, oh, I'm yeah. sure that that's the reason, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Massey. But I, I, I yield back. I, I thank the gentleman. I'm going to yield to the, the ranking member. I'll just simply say again, I, I don't... This is a good faith argument. It, it, it's not complicated. Adding open and transparent to make a commitment to the American people that you're actually going to conduct a process that is open and transparent shouldn't be complicated. It shouldn't be difficult. And, I, and I, don't, I don't know why. I get it. I understand your opposition to some of the other amendments, including amendments that I'm going to offer. But uh, this really shouldn't be one of them. So, and I'll yield to the regular member. No, I, I think I may have an answer for you. I, I'm reading USA Today. There's an article, um, host Republicans, uh, uh, you know, talking about how they uh, omitted open and transparent from the resolution. And the, the excuse, uh, the rationale that uh, a Republican uh, aide gave was that uh, keeping open and transparent in uh, was wordy. Uh, I mean, I, 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 really, I mean, open and transparent, I mean, three words, too wordy, that's the excuse to uh, eliminate it. Uh, it's, it's laughable. I mean, this, this is ridiculous. I mean, again, uh, I think we all should agree that this should be open and transparent. Um, you know, it was in the previous uh, resolution when we were in, char in charge, let, let's just put it in. I mean, that's a sign of good faith. Uh, but to say that it's being omitted because it's wordy, I mean, come on, give me a break. Uh, I yield back. I yield back. Or I yield to the I don't know whose time it is, but I assume it's the chairman's time, so, so I appreciate it. Uh, look, again, I've got a just level set here. This, this amendment literally does nothing other than change the wording of the, the subheaders. I mean, and the ranking member just admitted that. I mean, we're here talking about changing investigative to open and transparent investigative. Uh, that, that's it. Uh, just, to put this, just to put this in perspective, I have the side-by-side -side comparative, the one, the comparative the 116th and the 118th uh, resolution. Well, and what, yeah. Why delete it? Why would you delete it? it because we have, our, our hearings have been in the open. They've been open and transparent. Well, you deliberately and, and, deleted this. Why? And, and again, I was with what Mr. Massey was talking about. I was on judiciary. A lot of those meetings were, in, in fact, most of them were in a skiff. 
And as Mr. Massey said, had we come out of that skiff and reported what was being said and conducted, we would have been arrested and gone to jail. We, our, our process here has been absolutely open. It's been, it, it's, there's, the public has been included, told, it, as compared to what Speaker Pelosi did, where again, we were three levels below ground in a, in a skiff. So I, I, just, I just don't think this is necessary, but- Just for the know. record, gentlemen does control the time, so. Okay, Are thanks. I will, oh, you'll. Yeah, I mean, I, again, these words were deliberately deleted. And my friends keep on saying to us, it's not about Trump, it's not about Trump, it's not about Trump, but now it's about Trump. Uh, so uh, you can't have it both ways. But again, deliberately deleted the words open and transparent. Um, and I, with all due respect, the process that you are conducting right now, I don't believe is open and transparent. And by the way, I mean, I'm not, I'm not on the oversight committee either, but some things, you know, especially on the first impeachment were classified. Um, and um, there was a reason for some of that. But Again, all we're asking for is a gentleman to put back in the words open and transparent. Uh, for some reason, Republicans deliberately removed it. None of us can figure out why, but uh, I support the gentleman's amendment. I yield, thank you for yielding. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion or debate on the amendment? Hearing none, questions on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. 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 Those have it. That's for your recorded vote. Recorded vote's been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Burgess no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rashenthaler. No. Mr. Rashenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Neguse. Mr. Neguse, aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. No, Javit. The amendment's not agreed to. Yeah. Good morning. Oh, you want. Go Good ahead. morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. I keep hearing from Republicans you say we're going to follow the facts where we lead on this impeachment investigation. But aren't there going to be a lot of conservatives in your party because this has been drummed up for so long? We're going to do impeachment. We're looking at these tax records. We're looking at the Hunter Biden stuff here. That if you guys don't call an impeachment vote in the next few months, they're going to say, wait a minute. That's it. I mean, haven't you put them over the barrel a little bit if you, in fact, do not have a vote to impeach the president of the United States in a couple of months? Chad, we're following the Constitution, and I've made this very clear. Remember, my background is constitutional law. I served on impeachment defense team twice under President Trump. We developed, unfortunately, Elisa and I, an expertise in this area. This is not something they really covered in law school. Uh, what you know about impeachment, if you look at the Constitution, is it's a heavy authority that's given to the House, specifically to the House. That's where the, the power lies. And next to the declaration of war, you've all heard me say many times, I think it may be the heaviest power that we have. It's very, very serious business. It has to be conducted in that way. The impeachment inquiry is necessary now, as, our, as Whip Emmer just explained, because we've come to this impasse where following the facts where they lead is hitting a stone wall because the White House is impeding that investigation now. They're not allowing witnesses to come forward and thousands of pages of documents. So we have no choice to fulfill our constitutional responsibility. We have to take the next step. We're not making a political decision. It's not. It's a legal decision. So people have feelings about it one way or the other. We can't prejudge the outcome. The Constitution does not permit us to do so. We have to follow the truth where it takes us, and that is exactly what we're going to do. And I'll note, too, I know that, that, that people are, um, you know, frustrated sometimes with the, the time that's being invested in this, but this is the way the founders anticipated that something like this would go. There's, there's no, there shouldn't be any such thing as a snap impeachment, a sham impeachment like the Democrats did against President Trump. This is the opposite of that. And that's why people are getting restless, because they want things to happen quickly. If you follow the Constitution and you do the right thing, you cannot rush it. You have to follow the facts. So, but you don't think there's an expectation by the base that, that you guys are, are going to, again, I know all these <laughs> predicates and caveats here. There's not an expectation that your side is going to impeach the Chad, president because, Chad, because that's what they were elected in the majority. For. People have a lot of opinions and a lot of expectations on all sides. What we are bound to do because of our oath to the Constitution is to follow it, and that's what we're going to do. Next question. And, yeah. and just to follow up on that, thank you. Uh, Much of an answer on this one, so I don't, maybe Mr. Norman might give me a. Well, you know, <clears throat> as far as the wordsmithing of it, may or shall, or. Here's it's a big difference. I get that. Here's what's going to happen the results 
that's coming out of these committees. I don't dictate when the committees go in and what they do. You do through Just the like resolution. Donald Trump doesn't dictate well. uh, what happens. All I know is the results will be transparent. And, and Ms. Gallen, I agree with you. Let's let the American people judge. And Ms. Uh, Ledger Fernandez, you bring up uh, Hunter's drug issues. Yes, everybody has problems, uh, or a lot of people have gone through the same things. But everybody in America has to pay tax. Everybody has to account for money that they make. Everybody uh, should not get the deal that Hunter Biden was trying to get. And I'll comment, you mentioned that um, his business associate said that probably the President Biden was talking about the wind and the weather. Here's, what, here's the testimony from Devin Archer um, in one of the hearings testified that people would be intimidated to mess with Burisma legally because of the Biden brand. During the trans transcribed interview with Devin Archie, he described the Biden, Biden brand as a value uh, to a company such as Burisma. Question, you keep saying brand, but by brand you mean the Biden family, uh, family correct? Archer, correct. Question, and that brand is what, in your opinion, was a majority of what the value that was delivered from Hunter Biden to Burisma? Answer, I didn't say majority, but I wouldn't speculate on percentages. But I do think th that was an element of it. Mr. Biggs, when you say Biden family, sorry to cut you in here, I just wanted to get a clarification. You aren't talking about Dr. Jill or anybody else. You're talking about Joe Biden. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's fair to say. And this, I, that was the answer. I don't know any other clear way uh, to, to, to show and to be transparent. Th this is testimony. And, and if you go back, uh, Mr. Goose, I mean, all the things that have been found and will, from what I understand, will be found, um, you can't erase LLCs. You can't, can't erase the pseudonyms that Congressman Roy talked about in the, the text and emails. You can't erase that. You can't erase the checks. He's got bank statements or don't just drop out of the air and you can dispute it. So the transparency, I agree with. Uh, the, the fact of how it's being conducted and what will come out of it, I think the American people will judge. And the Biden family has gotten well, by Mr. long enough on this. Mr. Norman, I would, it. I would say. I yield, I yield to you. I yield back. The lady yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Texas. Recognized. One thing, and I'm, I'm not going to dwell on it in the interest of time. I, I do want to note there is significant indication that has been referenced by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that there's no backing by the American people. Um, AP poll 65, 68 percent of United States adults uh, believe that President Biden is engaged in illegal or unethical but not illegal conduct. 35 percent say illegal, 33 percent say unethical but not illegal. That's all while we're going through the hearings and looking at the conduct that we see before us. So there is a significant amount, and not just Republicans, significant amount of independents, some Democrats, who believe that the president, uh, as vice president, as president, as private citizen, has engaged in conduct that is deserving of looking into it. To answer the gentleman's question, the question before us, I think, is whether President Biden used his office for his personal gain or his family's gain, whether there was influence peddling involved, whether there was international dollars flowing to the president as vice president or as private sector, uh, private citizen after leaving the office of the vice presidency. And we have an obligation to follow those dollars. That's point one. Point two is whether or not the vice president then lied about said behavior, uh, repeatedly saying, uh, saying, I never talked business with anybody with respect to his son's business dealings. We have ample evidence on the record indicating that there was, in fact, presence by the president when he was the vice president at business dealings of Hunter and knew full well that that kind of behavior was ongoing. Thirdly, and importantly, is whether or not there has been rampant obstruction by virtue of what we've seen out of the Department of Justice with the orders going down to say that you're going to say that this is, you know, under investigation, that you're not going to answer those questions. What exactly happened, by the way, with Weiss cutting this sweetheart deal? Suddenly the judge says no. Uh, that's a bad deal. Suddenly, then, there's going to be actual real indictments that followed from that in September and then notably last week. Following those dollars, looking to see what exactly happened, I can, I've got double pages here of all of the ways in which the Department of Justice 
has uh, breached standard protocol, allowing the statute of limitations, very quite likely purposely, very quite likely purposely, allowing the statute of limitations to lapse on tax problems from 2014 to 2015, very specifically because that was most likely to be tied to the time at which Vice President Biden was involved. These, there are numerous things I could go down the list of, but there are lots of things the American people want to know the truth about. We're going to continue to pursue the truth, and that's what this is about. I yield back. With the gentleman. Is there further discussion or debate in the amendment? It sounds like you're not sold yet on whether to actually support removing, charging, and then removing the president from office. That's a very different level. Obviously, the inquiry is the beginning of it and where we end up. Uh, we'll have to figure out how, when we get there. But. Uh, but you're right. It, it's a serious uh, piece of legislation when you're actually full impeachment. Uh, but what we're talking about now is an inquiry to ask some serious questions and force the administration to actually respond to them. And that's why this is important. I'm of the belief that um, having served in New York where corruption, sadly, is something we deal with all too often, that the legislature, Congress, should provide the appropriate oversight. We should ask the questions. So the next step, as the president has said, uh, they don't believe they need to comply with certain subpoenas or requests for information. Uh, without uh, this inquiry moving to the next step. I'll support moving it to the next step. But this is a day-by-day -day, uh, uh, effort to uncover facts and then respond to those facts as they become for, as we, they become public and known to us. I think this inquiry is going to start and where the, where the truth takes us is where it takes us. Homer of Kentucky. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cole. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to support House Resolution 918. Joe Biden has repeatedly lied to the American people about his family's corrupt influence peddling schemes. He told the American people he never spoke to his son about his family's business dealings. He claimed there was an absolute wall between his official government duties as vice president and his family. He said his family never made money from China. All of these are blatant lies. Our investigation has revealed how Joe Biden knew of, participated in, and benefited from his family cashing in on the Biden name around the world. Since January, we have learned some of the following. The Bidens created 20 shell companies, most of which were created while Joe Biden was vice president. The Bidens and their associates then raked in over $24 million through these shell companies from China, Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Romania between 2014 and 2019. At least 10 members of the Biden family have benefited or participated in these schemes. The Bidens layered these payments through their bank accounts to hide the sources of the money. The banks even flagged many of these transactions in more than 150 suspicious activity reports to the Treasury Department. One bank investigator was so concerned about Hunter Biden's financial transactions with the Chinese company that he wanted to reevaluate the bank's relationship with him. He noted that his transactions served, and I quote, no current business purpose, end quote. That's what I call a shell company. According to Devin Archer, a Biden family associate, Joe Biden was the brand of the business. The brand showed up. Joe Biden spoke to his son's associates by speakerphone over 20 times, dined with foreign oligarchs and a Burisma executive, and had coffee with his son's Chinese associate, all when he was vice president. Weeks after Joe Biden left the vice presidency, money from this Chinese Communist Party-linked entity began to make its way to the bank accounts of several Biden family members. Based on one Biden associate's interview with the FBI, these payments were sent to the Bidens as a, quote, thank you. Ask any Justice Department public corruption investigator about the importance of payments received after one leaves public office. It's a hallmark of corruption. We are now at a pivotal moment in our investigation. We will soon depose and interview several members of the Biden family and their associates about these influence peddling schemes. But we are facing obstruction from the White House. The White House is seeking to block key testimony from current and former White House staff. It's also withholding thousands of records from Joe Biden's time as Vice President. Pri time President Biden must be held accountable for his lies, corruption, and obstruction. 
I urge my colleagues to support this important and necessary resolution. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman for yielding. This is a story as old as the hills. You've got a politician who does certain things. Those actions then benefit his family financially, and then there's an effort to conceal it and sweep it under the rug. The best example is to go back to the Ukrainian energy company Burisma. Four key facts about Hunter Biden's involvement with this company and Joe Biden's involvement. First, Hunter Biden gets put on the board of Burisma. Second, he's not qualified to be on the board of Burisma. Don't take my word for it. He said it himself. Third, he asked, he's asked by the executives of Burisma, can you weigh in with Washington, with D.C., to help alleviate the pressure we are under? Three days later, the vice president of the United States, now President Joe Biden, goes to Ukraine and conditions American tax dollars for Ukraine on the firing of the prosecutor who was applying the pressure to the company Hunter Biden was on the board of. That, that's why we're going with an official impeachment inquiry vote today. That's why this needs to be investigated. There are two resolutions we're considering, Resolution 918 and Resolution 917 incorporated if we pass 918. Three names mentioned in those two resolutions. One name, of course, is Joe Biden, President of the United States. But the other two names in Resolution 917 are two DOJ tax lawyers, Mark Daly and Jack Morgan, two guys we want to talk to that the Biden Justice Department says we're not going to let you talk to them. With this vote, we think we get to talk to those individuals. And here's why it's important. These guys, these two individuals, initially said where there should be tax, felony tax charges for 2014, 2015 in the Hunter Biden investigation. And that's important because those are the years when the bulk of the income from Burisma came to Hunter Biden. They initially said there should be tax char or, uh, felony tax charges for those years. Then they changed their position. Eight months later, they changed their position. We want to know why. Why did you do that? Why did you let the statute of limitations intentionally let the statute of limitations lapse for those years? My theory is it's one thing to charge Hunter Biden on a gun charge in Delaware. It's another thing to say we're not going to charge another thing to charge him on Burisma tax years because that gets you to Joe Biden. That gets you to the White House. That's why we need this vote. The impeachment power, as the chairman said, is a power that solely resides in the House. When you have a majority of the House of Representatives go on record, that sends a message. We think we get timely participation from the witnesses we need to talk to and the documents Mr. Comer has been seeking. Finally, I would say this about this changing story from the White House, this changing story from the Justice Department. Today, Hunter Biden did a press conference. He was supposed to be in a deposition. He did a press conference. And at that press conference, he said, my father was not financially involved in the business. Well, that's an important qualifier. We haven't heard that. For three years, we haven't heard that. All we've heard is Joe Biden had no involvement. Now his son does a press conference when he's supposed to be being deposed and says he wasn't financially involved. Well, what involvement was it? We know there was phone calls, dinners, and meetings. What involvement was it? That's why we want to ask these questions with important witnesses. That's why this resolution is important. I urge a yes vote. With that, I yield back. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, the Democrat Party is telling us that they care about taxpayers, but the son of the President of the United States is a tax cheat. He ignored federal tax law on purpose. He laundered money through 20 LLCs. He concealed millions of dollars of overseas money. And the only reason he was able to accomplish these feats of getting so much money into his companies is because the President is his father. That is it. If you're asking why we are looking for an impeachment inquiry, it is because there were 170 suspicious activity reports at the Department of Treasury, which we went and looked through. And every one of those reports said very clearly that there was evidence of money laundering and potentially tax evasion. There were hours of deposition. There's a web of LLCs with company names that have no business interest whatsoever. And then we have finally uncovered one example, Mr. Speaker, $5 million from a foreign company going to a, going to a joint venture partly controlled by Hunter Biden. Next day, 400,000 goes from Hunter Biden to... Gentleman's time has expired. Oh. I yield the gentleman an additional 30 seconds. Thank you. Gentleman's recognized. 400,000 goes to an account controlled by Jim and Sarah Biden. Sarah Biden writes a check to herself, and then $40,000 is in a check to Joseph Robinette Biden, the President of the United States. That's your evidence. If you want to talk crime, bribery, co-conspirator to being a, a to fire violations, and we can go on and on. Vote for the resolution. Congress must investigate these crimes. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, gentlemen. I'll turn it over to Chairman Jordan.
Well, I, I would just echo what the chairman said. You know, we're disappointed that he didn't show up. I mean, he was just across the way at the Capitol. You think he could have come here and sat for questions? If you do it in an open format now, you're going to get you're going to get filibusters. You're going to get speeches. You're going to get all kinds of things. Uh, what we want is the facts. And the way you get the facts in every single uh, every single investigation I've been involved in is you bring people in for an interview behind closed doors where you can get those facts. And then, as the chairman said, we'd love for him to come public. Finally, I would say this. Uh, Mr. Biden's counsel and the White House have both argued that the reason he couldn't come for a deposition was because there wasn't a formal vote for an impeachment inquiry. Well, that's going to happen in a few hours. We think it's going to pass. We think the House of Representatives will go on record with the power that solely resides in the House to say we are in an official impeachment inquiry phase of our oversight. And when that happens, we'll see what their excuse is then. They should have been here today, but once we take that vote, we expect him to come in for, a, uh, for his interview, for his deposition. And frankly, uh, we'll also, I think, look at uh, contempt proceedings as we move forward. With that, we'll take your question. Why not just call his bluff? I mean, he's, he's here. He's obviously not wanting to sit for a deposition. This could be one chance to get to hear from him. Why not just call his bluff and see if he's willing to sit? Because there's a way you do investigations is where you're not. Everyone I've been, been involved with, from clear back to uh, the, the IRS targeting uh, conservatives, to Benghazi, to the impeachment people, everyone, you do it in a way where they come in for private. Uh, this is what the Democrats did. Don Jr. had to testify twice. Twice in, in, a, in a deposition setting, two different committees. But oh, somehow it doesn't that doesn't apply to the Biden family. That's not how it works in our country. It's supposed to be equal treatment, the same treatment under the law. Mr. Mr. Biden, Mr. Biden. Question is on the adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the, air, the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? I ask for a recorded vote. Recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote.
On this vote, the yeas are 221 and the nays are 212. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The gentleman from Missouri is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Chairman Cole. President Biden has hidden from the American people his knowledge of and role in his family's overseas business dealings. Even in the face of overwhelming evidence showing his knowledge and involvement, President Biden still refuses to come clean. So far, two key DOJ witnesses have failed to show for congressionally subpoenaed depositions after DOJ directed them not to appear. Other witnesses have refused to answer certain questions from investigators and the Biden administration has refused to turn over many of the documents requested by Congress, claiming this inquiry was not properly authorized. Let there be no mistake. Today's vote asserts Congress's authority to conduct an impeachment inquiry and gather all the evidence to proceed with our investigation. The American people deserve answers. Here's what we know so far. The existence of multiple email aliases suggests that Joe Biden was deliberately trying to conceal his activities from the public, including one-on-one -on -one communications with a key Hunter Biden business partner during his vice presidency. We also learned that investigators were blocked from looking into potential campaign finance crimes by the Biden campaign. Hunter Biden had only known Kevin Morris, a Democrat donor, for two months before Morris started settling his tax debts to the tune of about $2 million, and then spent about $3 million more to cover Hunter's lifestyle. In the midst of the 2020 campaign, just weeks before Super Tuesday, primary elections that would decide the future 
of Joe Biden's candidacy, Morris emailed Hunter Biden's business associates, and there was, quote, considerable risk personally and politically to not filing his late taxes. But the only person who faced political risk was Joe Biden, whose campaign the whistleblowers had reason to believe Morris was speaking to. As members of Congress, we have to abide by campaign finance limits, and so must the president. Morris's millions in payments to cover Hunter Biden's taxes and other financial obligations appeared to the whistleblowers to be an illegal donation to the Biden campaign. Unfortunately, they were blocked from investigating further. Time and again, when investigators found a lead that pointed to Joe Biden, DOJ, they stepped in and prevented, prevented them from pursuing it. Just 30 seconds. Yield the gentleman an additional 30 seconds. The gentleman's recognized for additional 30 seconds. Thanks to the evidence released by the whistleblowers, the DOJ indicted Hunter Biden on nine tax charges, including three felonies. Everything, everything the whistleblowers told us about the Hunter Biden tax case has proven right. I'm convinced they're also right about the links to Joe Biden they were prevented from following. Congress owes it to the American people to follow the facts wherever they lead and pass this resolution, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman's time has expired. Some Republicans I talked to in the committee say they do think the evidence is already there. They feel like they've seen enough to actually file articles of impeachment. But you two chairmen, do you feel like you've seen enough now? I've said, all, I've said all along I think the evidence is compelling, uh, but we still need to talk to Mr. Schwerin, Mr. Walker, Mr. Bob Alinsky, Kevin Morris, Jim Biden, Hunter Biden. We need to talk to the two individuals who are part of Blue Star Strategies, uh, Kathy pa uh, Sally Painter and, and uh, uh, Ms. Tramontano. So those are people we need to talk to. We think with the vote this afternoon, we get those individuals in in a more timely fashion, and we get the documents we want. And I would still go back to this. One hour ago, I think the biggest takeaway was the statement from Mr. Biden where he said, my father was not financially involved in the business. That is a huge change, which means, sort of means he's involved. I think that's how anyone with common sense would read it. He's been involved, just not financially. That is a huge departure from everything they've said now for the last three and a half years. So as the chairman pointed out, the White House's story has changed multiple times. The Justice Department uh, story has changed multiple times on how they handle this investigation. But the story that hasn't changed, the testimony that has been consistent and stood up to cross-examination is the two whistleblowers. Their story has not changed, and frankly, it's been buttressed and reinforced by every. We've done eight different depositions of people involved in the investigation at the Justice Department, the Hunter Biden investigation, and none of them have refuted what those guys say. So over time, it just keeps changing from the White House. And this, this statement today, I think, is, is the biggest news of, of the morning, I guess, along with the fact that he didn't show up, which he's supposed to do. Thank you all very much. We've got to go. Thank you. What food did when in different circumstances. But on the merits, the question here isn't about production of documents. Anybody who's ever been involved with subpoenas and presentation of documents knows that document dumps are fairly normal. The question is, is what is actually being presented? What is being shared? Um, the Oversight Committee has identified 82,000 pseudonym communications that could, and this is the whole point of an investigation, contain key evidence uh, for which they've only received 14 documents. These are the questions about the pseudonym emails uh, and uh, that have been identified, 29,000 of which are between the office of the vice president and the family's businesses. So for those of us who are concerned about the flow of international dollars into the Biden family, which is hard to even dispute based on the indictment that is now sitting before us with respect to Hunter <coughs> and where he's gone with his tax records, but importantly, what we know from other evidence about the extent of the millions of dollars flowing into the Biden family, Hunter and other members of the family. The question is, is, well, what did the vice president know when he was vice president? What did the president know? What did he know between those times? That's the point of the investigation. Again, we have 82,000 pseudonym communications, 29,000 between the office of the vice president and these family businesses, and yet we only have 14 of those produced. We still have the subpoenas outstanding for Mark Daly and Jack Morgan that I alluded to before, that are not being responded to. The reason is, is because those go to the heart of the problem. Those get to the heart of the question. 
So the point here, and with respect to previous quotes and so forth, the quote that the gentleman was referring to was my conclusion at the end after the inquiry is my conclusion about that point is said with respect to the articles. My, my point here is with respect to an inquiry, and, and look, again, none of us are perfect. We go through this. I, I just went back and reread the op-ed I wrote on December 11th, 2019, in which I concluded not to uh, support the impeachment articles. But notably, I presented that I did not think the phone call was perfect. I did think there were issues that merited looking into when I was sitting before all of that to make sure we understood exactly what the communications were. The point is we should pursue all of the facts wherever they may lead. As the, as the body in Article One that is supposed to be checking Article Two, and in this instance, what we're looking at here are very important, unresponded to queries by this branch, Oversight and Judiciary and others, to the administration. Again, what are we concerned about? What are we afraid about learning from Daly or Morgan? Why do we not want to make sure that Daly and Morgan come forth and testify? Why would that be concerned? Why do we not want to have those emails that are uh, potentially pseudonym emails, as we understand it, in terms of the communications between the office of the vice president and the family businesses, when we're talking about millions of dollars flowing from international sources with all sorts of connections with people who have testified on the record, Devin Archer and others, about where the president was and the president's knowledge of the existence of these family businesses and what he and the fact that they were selling, quote, the brand. There is significant amount of evidence that has come forward that raises questions that this body should want to know the truth about. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen. I think it is important for the public to have transparency about the impact of the Ukrainian alleged bribes to Hunter Biden, potentially on our own foreign policy. So the reason I think this is actually a productive direction to go is we need transparency on the facts. Did the Biden family directly or indirectly sell off our foreign policy to make their family rich? I think there's enough circumstantial evidence to suggest that that may indeed have happened. And I think that that's unconscionable if it did.